All right. Um, Raghav, do you have to give me the okay to start or? No, so uh, Bjorn, it's all yours to okay. welcome folks to the last day. All, all right. So yeah, welcome everyone. It's 9.02, so I think we can get started. Uh, I'm Bjorn Schenke. I'm chairing together with Lauren Schwiebert um, today. So um, as you know, there's a Slack channel um, where you can post questions. There's a specific one for today called hashtag July 28 invited talks. So if you have a question, please post it there. And uh, one of us will monitor um, those questions. And if they are um, urgent, uh, we can interrupt the speaker. And if not, we go through them after the talk. Um, yeah, with that, um, I think everyone knows the drill already better than me since um, you've been here for two weeks. Um, the first speaker uh, of the session is, and these are invited talks uh, today. And the first speaker is Xiao Xuan Chu from BNL. Um, she's a member of the STAR collaboration and the EPIC collaboration, and she's done some very exciting measurements with the cold Rick, Rick Cold QCD program already on saturation and on spin. And um, we are happy to hear about um, the physics set the I see from her. So um, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Uh, today I want to talk about the physics at the ESC and also uh, as uh, Bjorn just introduced. So as for ESC, we only have the simulation. So today I also want to talk about these physics uh, connections to the Riku QCD program. Okay, so the ESC is planned to uh, be built on the rig ring and it is a high luminosity polarized electron proton and electron ion collider with a very wide coverage of the center of mass energies. So you could see the uh, luminosity numbers in the right hand side plot as a function of the center of mass energy. And the ESC project includes one collider, uh, one interaction regime, uh, which is the IP6 here, and the one general purpose detector. So um, the, the, this is the, the the IP collaboration located at, at this IP6. And for ESC facility, it will support uh, over two decades increase of the kinematics in X and Q square space. So I will introduce the X and Q square later in my slides. And uh, here it is the information of the beam setup. So we collide the incoming electron with proton beam, deuterium, heavy nuclear, and helium-3. And for the uh, leptons energy, we have these three sets of the electrons energy, and we provide also very wide coverage of the target proton or nuclei uh, uh, energy uh, as a beam. And uh, for the polarization, we, we can provide uh, transverse and longitudinal polarize of the target proton beam or uh, nuclear beam, uh, the uh, helium-3 and the later deuterium beam. For the electron beam, we provide longitudinal polarization electrons. And uh, the ESC physics can be divided into several groups. So the first one, uh, we want to study the uh, inside the nucleon, uh, what is the spin uh, contribution and what is the uh, distribution of the C quarks and the gluons. And uh, in the end, how these uh, C quark and gluon and also the valence quarks spin and uh, distribution uh, forms the property, properties of the nucleon. And the second, we want to understand the quark and gluons and also the colorless jets, how they interact with the nucle nuclear uh, medium. And uh, how do the confined hydronic state emerge from the quarks and gluons? And due to the quark and gluons interactions, uh, how can we get the nuclear bonding? And the last topic is uh, we want to understand the dense nuclear envir environment. So specifically mean the very high uh, density of the gluon. So we want to understand its strong gluon field uh, in terms of the gluon saturation. So basically, if we want to address these old physics questions, we need to access the platonic level uh, dynamics inside the nucleon. Uh, at ESC, we need to use the electron as a probe. So how can we access the patterns in DS process? I list it some example of the channels and also observables. So let's look at the first one. Uh, the el incoming electron interacts with the proton by exchange the virtual photon, and we can detect the scattered ele electron uh, from our detectors. 
Uh, if we only detect this uh, scattered electron, that is inclusive DIS process. Besides that, if we can identify the hadrons in the final stage, that means the semi-inclusive DIS. In this kind of process, we can probe the parton uh, dynamics uh, through measuring the kinematics of the final state hadrons, and we can also measure the fragmentation functions by identifying the hadrons, specific type of hadrons related to the flavor of the parton. So that requires a, a wide coverage of the PID of the rapidity and momentum. And the other, another special channel is a charge current. So the electron interact with the proton by exchange the Ws. The W plus and W minus naturally provide us the possibility to probe the different flavor dynamic, flavor of the proton dynamics in, inside the nucleon. And in this channel, we don't have the fragmentation, so it can be taken as the complementary channel of the CDs. Uh, however, the W mass is very high, so this measurement can only be performed at a very high center mass energy collisions. And uh, apart from this difference, uh, in this channel, we don't have the scattered electron, we only have the neutrino. So in this process, if we want to reconstruct the kinematics, we basically need to detect all the final state particles, uh, which is different from CDs. And then the observable, like jets, the jets is the best observable to um, uh, be as a proxy of the parton level uh, of, of the parton. So we can uh, study the inclusive jets and digests in different sub processes. We can study the jet substructure and um, we can also tag the digest production in photon gluon fusion. This process is very sensitive to the gluon dynamics in DIS. And here is also the detector requirement for this. Uh, uh, for this observable. And in this uh, talk, uh, I cannot cover all the related measurements to address like order like uh, to the all uh, ESC physics questions and the different channels observables. So in this talk, I will uh, emphasize uh, on the uh, detailed measurements I was involved uh, in RECOQC program and also the ESC simulations. So before I move to the detailed measurement, uh, what is needed uh, to address the ESC physics? Uh, I want to uh, introduce the kinematics. So as I mentioned before, by detecting the outgoing electrons uh, kinematics, one can reconstruct the kinematics of event level information like the Q square and the X. Q square is a hard scale uh, of this interaction, and it can be reconstructed through the kinematics of the outgoing electron. And uh, this Q-square actually can take it as a transverse resolution. So in transverse plane, if we can reach Q-square to be a, a 100 GeV, the transverse resolution is about 0 0.002 femtometer, which is small enough for us to, to precisely probe the inner structure of the target nucleon. And the X is defined as a longitudinal momentum fraction of the star quark uh, in terms of the momentum of the of the of the total nucleon, so and that is uh, that uh, kinematic kinematics can also be reconstructed by measuring the outgoing electrons. And this method of uh, kinematics reconstruction in DIS is very direct and model dependent. So it's an advantage in EP collisions compared to the, those kinematics reconstruction from PP collisions. After this introduction, I want to start with my first part of the, uh, of the physics measurement in terms of the collinear proton distribution functions. The collinear is defined as a longitudinal direction. So you can take it as uh, the same direction of the, uh, of the proton beam. And uh, uh, we will use, uh, as we use Z to describe, this, uh, uh, to describe this direction. So basically uh, we don't have the transverse information in the collinear proton dis distribution. It is just a one dimensional structure of the protonic uh, level uh, into uh, into the nucleon. So the one one dimensional quaternic structure can be extracted from both EP collisions and PP collisions. But the idea is the same. So under the factorization framework, the final state particles cross section as a function of the reconstructed x and q square as I introduced in previous slide. This cross section can be uh, can be um, grouped into the convolution of the collinear pattern distribution function f at q square and uh, uh, the half scattering cross section and the, uh, and the hydrolyzation. 
So by measuring this fellow state cross-section, one can perform the global fit to extract the information of the collinear pattern distribution function. And the extraction of the collinear pattern distribution function from two collision systems actually provides a complementarity and also the test of the universality property of the collinear pattern distribution functions. And then from the first uh, EP collider in the world, HERA, what we learned about this collinear pattern distribution function from HERA data. So in the right left-hand side plot, the measured cross-section is presented as a function of Q square and X. So you could see at the relative high X regime, in this, re this regime, the measured cross-section is almost independent of Q square, and we call it beyond scanning. And in this regime, the Liu-Kliang is dominated by the three valence quark. If we access the low X regime, in this regime, more and more soft gluons are the, uh, emerge in this regime. And uh, uh, we see the measured cross-section increases as uh, the Q-square increases. So this evolution of the Q-square is generated by the gluon distributions. And uh, by uh, extracting, a performing a global fit of uh, this measured cross-section, we extract the collinear pattern distribution function. We see the balance part dominates at high X regime. However, at low X regime, uh, we see the gluon density is very high. So uh, for balance part, it is already uh, constrained very well with higher data. And ESC will focus on regime at a small X regime. We know that from fossil principle, the gluon density cannot go forever. Uh, increase forever, and this increase is generated by the gluon splitting, one gluon split into two. However, it has to be slowed down. So this phenomenon is explained by the gluon recombination, two gluons recombining to one. If these two processes reach a balance, at this point, we call this gluon saturation. Mathematically, the gluon saturation is defined as a Q square smaller than QS. QS is a saturation scale, it is larger with high value pi. So that means in high value pi collision, uh, we are like easier to access this saturation regime. The saturation represents small x and small q square regime. And then let's see what we can do with ESC data. So it is predicted uh, in EP collisions, if there is no saturation in proton beam, but there is saturation in high value nuclear beam. So we can take EP collisions as a baseline they generate back-to-back -back digests or dihedrons. And we can also measure the, these digests or dihedron correlation functions in e gold collisions. And uh, we compare the correlation function between of them. It is predicted the correlation function is going to be lower. There is a suppression in e gold collision if there's a saturation compared to EP. And on the other hand, is the back-to-back -back configuration is smeared in P gold. So that means the Correlation function is broader in E gold collisions com compared to EP. So we have these two signatures. In ESC simulations, by implementing this saturation model in E gold collisions, we can see the simulation results reproduce this suppression of the back to back correlation in E gold collisions compared to EP. And if we do not implement any saturation model, we only use the nuclear PDF and uh, uh, including the energy loss. There, we cannot reproduce this suppression. So that means the suppression is sensitive to the gluon saturation with ESC data. And the other se se uh, second signature is about broadening. So apart from the saturation, there are also other effects can also cause the broadening phenomena. Um, so for example, the Sulakov effect, which means uh, gluon, soft gluon radiation. Think about the two cases. One is without gluon radiation. The other one is with gluon radiation. And we see the back-to-back -back configuration is also smeared with gluon radiation. So you can also see it. The uh, correlation function with Sudakov effect is wider than the, than the one without Sudakov effect. And this Sulakov effect can be described in the simulation by pattern shower. So you could see if we turn on the pattern shower in PCR, actually this uh, describes very well with a the theory with the Sulakov effect. So in the simulation, if we want to study a uh, separate contribution in terms of saturation, Sulakov effect, we can also by uh, implement the pattern shower or not pattern shower inside the simulation. And the second point I want to make, make in the EP uh, measurement, 
As I mentioned, the saturation phenomena is all related to small x and small q square regime. How can we access small x? X is anti-proportional to the center of mass energy. So you can see from the simulation, if we increase the center of mass energy from 40 GeV to 90 GeV, we can probe small x regime. In the other hand, the x is uh, proportional to the rapidity. So you could see from more forward rapidity to the more backward rapidity, we can probe smaller x regime. So that is also what we can do, we can perform with the future ESC data to uh, approach a uh, small x, which is close to the saturation regime. And then let's see what we have so far, according to the other colliders results, let's see PP collisions at star. We did measure the forward 2 pi 0 correlations, the rapidity coverage of the 2 pi 0 is 2.6 to 4, and we measure the correlation functions in P gold, P aluminum, and P PP collisions. In relative low PT regime, we did see very clear signature of the suppression in P gold, P aluminum, and also compared to PP collisions. On the other hand, if we look at the high PT regime, high PT represents high X and high Q square, which is far away from the satur uh, saturation regime. We didn't observe the suppression. So this is a signature of the suppression. How about the broadening? We extract the width of uh, the correlation function in P gold, P aluminum, and we use the width divided by the width we extracted from PP collisions and we check the ratio. So we see, uh, for P, P aluminum, the ratio between P aluminum to PP is almost one. So there is no broadening phenomenon observed observe in P aluminum collision. And for P gold, we even saw it decreases uh, slower than one. So for both of the collision system, we didn't observe the broadening phenomenon. Why? Uh, from the simulation studies, let's say in EP collisions, the gluon saturation is implemented by adding this uh, intrinsic PT by adding this uh, transverse momentum the peak uh, before the collision. So, but apart from this uh, uh, saturation effect, the other uh, effect like initial state pattern shower, final state pattern shower, and also the fragment PT, all of those factors can also cause a broader uh, correlation function. Let's see the simulation results. So if we turn on the KT, the KT can only contribute a very small, like a small contribution in terms of uh, uh, getting the correlation function to be wider. So you could see the extracted weights from turn turn on KT only, but we found the initial state pattern shower is actually a very like um, a big effect uh, to cause a broad a broad correlation functions. So you could see after adding the initial state pattern shower, it becomes a very broad of the back-to-back -back correlation functions. So, and also you could see the effect from final state pattern shower and fragmentation, fragmentation PT. So in the end, uh, in the data, it contains all the effects. So it is very challenging to actually conclude the width of the correlation function caused by the contribution only from the saturation effect. And that is a, uh, a further measurement we can perform with ESE and we could understand more information about the broadening phenomena with ESE data. And a conclusion. So basically we need to perform this measurement at ESC, RIC and the uh, LGC. The reason is for ESC and RIC, we have similar intermediate collision energy. So the X and Q square field space is uh, similar with ESE and RIC. And, uh, one can only claim the discovery of the saturation effect by observe the similar, the same phenomena in both EA and PA collisions. For LGC data, it can contribute very small X regime, uh, but with relative high Q square. So one can uh, study the for the evolution of this phenomena by adding all of data together in the full X and Q square phase space. After I introduce the unpolarized cross section. So uh, unpolarized structure, how about the polarized structure? The proton spin can be posed as a quark spin, gluon spin, and the orbital angular momentum. So if we want to measure, uh, uh, measure the contribution of a different, uh, the individual contributions to the gluon spin, we can measure the uh, cross-section difference, which is similarly as the unpolarized case. So the cross-section is difference defined as the plus plus, polarizations uh, configuration minus the plus minus configuration. 
And this configuration is defined as, uh, for example, plus plus represent the polarization of the two beam uh, is a either exact the same as the momentum direction of the beam or both of them are opposite uh, direction of the momentum. And the other case is, uh, not, uh, is, uh, is a cross section with a plus minus uh, spin, uh, spin configuration. So after we measure the cross section, we can extract the polarized part and distribution functions by the global fit. And let's see what ESC data can do. So basically we use the simulation, we provide pseudo data from the simulation with EP collisions. And we measure this uh, cross-section difference. And the cross-section difference, uh, difference is plotted as a function of Q square and X. With this data, we provide it to the, uh, to the theorists, they perform this global fit. So we can see the impact of the ESC data to the gluon polarization, quark polarization, and orbital angular momentum. So by adding the ESC data, we could see the uncertainty is significantly reduced by adding the ESC data from different collision energies for the gluon spin and also for the quark spin. For the orbital angular momentum, you could look at the x-axis. So the orbital angular momentum contribution is the uh, proton spin minus the gluon and the quark spin. So you could see by adding the ESC data, the orbital angular momentum contribution is also significantly uh, reduced. And that is the impact of the ESC data in terms of the one dimensional polarized uh, part and distribution function. And then let's move to from the one dimensional structure to three dimensional structure. So the regional distribution WX, BT, KT actually describes the distribution uh, the part and distribution in five dimensions. X represents longitudinal direction of uh, longitudinal momentum fraction. BT represents the transverse position and KT represents the transverse momentum. If we integral the weakness distribution by the transverse position, we get this transverse momentum dependent part and distribution. And the, from the prediction, you see the 3D structure of the parton inside the nucleon. And by implement uh, integral the um, uh, weakness distribution with the transverse momentum KT, you could see the pattern distributions in the coordinate space. I'm not going to cover all the uh, measurements uh, in terms of uh, the different physics. So I want to give just one example how we measure one of the TMDs from the ESC data. So uh, the Sievers function is uh, one of the eight leading twist transverse uh, the TMDs. And it, it describes the correlation of the proton spin and the patterns KT. Because of the correlation from those of two, the in both EP or PP collisions, as long as this proton beam is transverse polarized, the final state pattern, uh, final state production is asymmetric. So we can measure this asymmetry between final state uh, productions. And this asymmetry is uh, um, uh, is very sensitive to the Sievers function. So we can extract the Sievers from this asymmetry. And on the other hand, it is predicted this asymmetry has the opposite sign between the EP collisions in cities and the, the PP collisions in Dryan. So by combining the ESC data and the RIC data, we can really test this fundamental prediction of the sign change of the Sievers function between two collision systems. And what do we have? So uh, in the uh, top plot, this is a simulation study. So ESC simulations, and uh, we measure this uh, uh, Sievers asymmetry, and we compare. And basically, we want to uh, validate this simulation. So we use a uh, campus setup, and uh, from the simulation, we can really reproduce the campus data. And uh, uh, this is for CDs and for the PP collisions. It's different. We use a WZ or Dryan production. So the Q scale, uh, the TMDs actually contains two scale, one soft and one hard scale. Uh, the different difference between those, those two collision systems, the hard scale in CDs is uh, the four momentum of, of the exchanged photon. And for the uh, dry yen or WZ production, Q square can be the mass of uh, the photon or uh, WZ. So, and here is the measured Sievers asymmetry from the W production at the star. And uh, uh, this is uh, the results from the uh, RAN 11 data. So we will have more data uh, coming for RAN 17 and RAN 22. And uh, 
then I'm really looking forward in the future. What is the uh, what it, uh, what will be the uh, measure uh, the, the results from the EP collisions? And in uh, the last part of my talk is about jets. So I will pro pre, uh, present two examples of the jets at the ESC. One is to study the PDFs of the photon. <clears throat> so the electron interact with the proton by exchange the photon. The photon actually behaves uh, uh, differently. So it can be the behaves like a direct photon state. That means the full energy of photon interact uh, enters into the half scantily. However, in the other hand, the uh, for the resolved photon state, the photon can fluctuate into quark and anti-quark pair. So only a fraction of the a fraction of the photon enters in the hot scantily. So uh, so far in this in this kind of resolved process, we can study the photon structure. And so far, the unpolarized photon PDFs is only extracted from very old data about five, 50 years ago from proton and anion daisy. And for the polarized case, we have zero knowledge about the polarized photon PDF. So both of the case will be, the information will be very important input for the ESC. What can we do? So we perform this simulation. We reconstruct it because both of them can produce digests. We reconstructed digests in the final state. And we use the kinematics X gamma, which means the, the partner's momentum fraction uh, uh, which is coming from the photon respect to the momentum of, of the photon. So it's very similar as the definition of the X related to the proton. And uh, we reconstruct this X gamma because only a fraction of the energy enters into the half standing re resolved process. So the X reconstructed X gamma should be smaller than one. For the direct process, the X gamma should be equal, equal, to, equal to one. So then we can make a uh, separation between these two sub-processes. And by measuring the final state digest production, one can extract the photon PDF. And by measuring the uh, cross-section uh, difference divided by the unpolarized cross-section to measure the, this asymmetry, one can extract the polarized photon PDF. So let's see what is the performance from the simulation study. This is the reconstructed X gamma between direct and both. Uh, Excuse resolved. me, you, yeah. you just have a couple minutes to finish. Yeah. Much. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So we reconstructed this F gamma between these different uh, sample processes, and we see the direct photon, uh, direct uh, stage uh, dominates at relative high x, high x gamma, and resolved uh, process dominates at low x gamma. So we can make a separation between those two sample processes, and our simulation is validated with reproducing the HARA data. So this is. Uh, uh, this is our simulation, and here is a plotted HARA data. And if we perform use the ESC setup, ESC energy, and we only include in, include one femtobar inverse data, we could see how large we can reduce the statistic uncertainty compared with ESC to the HARA data. And for the polarized case, this is a measured cross, uh, measured asymmetry as a function of the digit PT. So we assume maximum polarization of the photon, minimal polarization of the photon. We see uh, the uh, significant signature of uh, long zero uh, asymmetry uh, based on the polarization of the photon. So that asymmetry measured in the future with the ESC data can, used, can be used to extract the unknown polarized photon PDFs. And uh, the last uh, measurement before my summary is uh, the by using GIA to study the fragmentation. So basically we perform this simulation study, we reconstruct jets and we tie the leading particles species. Leading particle means the highest PT particle inside, inside the jets. If it is K, K on, pi on, proton, or even lambda, and we see what is the flavor of the originating quark. And we see very strong correlation between the leading particle species to the flavor of the originating quark. Uh, or, or, or part of SC. So if the leading particle is a pi plus, it is with very high probability, this uh, uh, originating quark is a U quark. And if we uh, check different PT fractions, so let's see the PT of the pi plus in terms of the PT of the whole jet to be greater than 0 0.3, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, 
if we increase this uh, PT fraction cut, the sensitivity is even enhanced. And we also see very strong correlation between the chaos to the, uh, uh, between the chaos uh, to the, um, uh, to the, to the, to the U park and also the um, uh, U bar park. And uh, then that's my summary. So uh, in the, for the, um, for this talk, we discussed about one dimensional structure of the parton uh, inside, inside the nucleon. So we talk about unpolarized PDF and polarized PDF. And we talk about for the unpolarized case, the gluon saturation, the ESC data is essential to understand the nonlinear gluon dynamics of the gluon. And uh, uh, for the polarized case, the ESC data will provide very large impact of considering the quark gluon classy and also the orbital orbit angular momentum. We talk about the measurements of the transfers uh, of the three dimensional structure measured in the nucleon by uh, introducing a measurement of the, how to extract the Sievers function. And we also talk about the observables as jets. So uh, we have different applications of jets at ESC. We use jets to extract the photon PDF. In both polarized and unpolarized case, we can use the jets to type the fragmentation function. So that's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so Bjorn, you can go ahead. Yeah, okay. Um, we had one question on the Slack. Uh, maybe, Harvey, or do you want to ask it yourself now? Or do you want me to read it? If you want to ask it, just unmute yourself. Uh, if not, I... Oh, it doesn't have a mic. Okay, so let me just read the question. Um, so from an experimental point of view, what are the main reasons for building the ERC when one might be able to use RIC or LHC instead to collide electron beams with ions or proton beams? I am sure there are many exciting reasons to build the new collider. I am just curious. So I think the question is assuming you can collide electron beams with ions or proton beams at the LHC as well. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the reason is, as I mentioned here, even though we can perform the measurement in PA collisions, but it is necessary. If we want to claim any discovery of the global situation, we need to observe the uh, signature in both EA and PA collisions. And uh, even and for, for, for ESC, as I mentioned here, the X and Q square phase space is a little bit similar with RIG. However, we have much, much higher luminosity uh, in EA, uh, in EIC. Uh, compared to RIG. So even though the free space is similar, but the statistic is going to be very different. So ESC can really help us to perform more quantitative uh, um, uh, measurement with respect to the gluon saturation. Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, the way I understand the question is like using RIC or LHC to include an electron beam as well. Essentially, that's what the EIC is for RIC, right? You're using RIC, but you have to add the electron beam and that yeah. will give you the EIC, right? Yeah. So um, if I understood this question correctly, this is what we're doing essentially, right? We're using the hadron beam of RIC and we put in an electron beam, but you know, that that involves a lot of technology and a lot of effort to, to do yeah, that. Because you, you can't just put in an electron in the same magnet. It, right. it, will, not, it uh -huh. will not work because it's a very low mass and it will radiate and it will just dump in and it will it will destroy your, your magnets. Yeah, you need to build a, a new uh, electron ring on top of, on top of uh, the weak ring, actually. Right. Um, he says, uh, he or she, I'm sorry, says, thank you. Um, all right, very good. Um, uh, so the other questions, um, I think we're mostly, at, oh, no, there's new, some new questions. So let me see. Um, there's a question by Ar Ar Archita Rani Dash. Um, how promising is the study of full jets at the EIC? Uh, uh, how promising is the study? So I think um, the question is, uh, is that related because the ESC collision energy is relatively low? So we only have a very, compare, especially compared to LHC, the very high energy. We actually reconstruct jets with uh, at the level of 4.5 and 5 GeV. So it's kind of soft 
soft jets um, uh, compared to the LHC jets. However, from the simulation study, I think it uh, reproduce, um, first of all, the jet simulation reproduce very well about existing data from HERA. But HERA, of course, the energy, collision energy is actually higher than the ESC here at Blue Heaven. Uh, I didn't put the plot here, but we did check in terms of this die jet production, uh, because we want to use jets kinematics to represent the kinematics of carton. So in the simulation, we have all the detailed information. We can, can actually get a correlation like the reconstructed jets uh, kinematics correlated with the uh, the pattern level kinematics. The correlation is very good actually. So I would see, but we cannot go to very too low PT. If we choose a PT, minimum PT cut of three GeV like too soft, we are losing the correlation between the jet level to pattern level. But if we increase the PT to be 4.5 and 5 GeV, and that sync, it is still very promising to use the jets represent the kinematics of the parton at ESC. Um, Ajita, with respect to that question, I guess. Hi, uh, so I just have a follow-up question. So first of all, thanks for the nice talk and thank you for answering it. Um, so I, I'm, I'm like curious to know, I mean, just now you said that uh, yeah, your collision range is like uh, pretty low. So in that case, when you do jet studies, I guess you will have to deal with, I mean, coming on to the real data, you will have to deal with a huge background. So how do you plan to, uh, yeah, deal with the background? The background from online events? Yes. Yeah, yeah we, we, you know, we have another paper, I think, published in 2020. We talk about how we extract the background. The background is... Um, uh, because we also compare it to the underlying events from rig energy. So ESC, for ESC, the background is going to be a little lower because it's electron beam. The proton problem, we have more beam remnant, right? For the EP collisions, we only have more like beam remnant from one proton side. So the background is even lower than rig, than rig PP energy, or the rig PP collisions. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we have time for maybe one more question. Yeah, we have another uh, on Slack. Uh, does the ESC have any plan to do heavy flavor physics? Yeah, as I said here, uh, I didn't mention it here because I I I present the analysis I mo most uh, like I involved in. So here we, this is a, a very good like golden channel for us to study the gluon dynamics, the photon gluon fusion. So. The photon interact with the gluon from the proton side and uh, produce a charm, charm and charm bar. So by detecting the charm production, we could study the, uh, the gluon dynamics. This is very clean channel and uh, we will definitely perform this measurement in the ESC in the future. Okay, um, there's some more questions on Slack, but I think we can address them right there uh, mm -hmm. so that we can stay on time. Yeah. I will, I will have a look of the Slack. Yeah, that'd be great too. Um, mm -hmm. If you can, if you can join that channel as well. Sure. Uh, okay. Yeah. So let's thank uh, Xiao Xuan again. Thank you very much um, for the very interesting talk. And you know, exciting things are going to happen, <laughs> hopefully, soon at BNL. Um, okay. So let's see. Uh, oh. we, moving on. Yeah. So Wei Yao is the next speaker. Do you want to try and share your screen? Does an exciting thing always happen at Brookhaven, Bjorn? Uh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but there's, uh, you know, it's, it's quite different from what happened over the last 20 years. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, new exciting things. Um, there are always new exciting things. So, yeah, okay, I'm digging a hole. <laughs> no, no. Um, but uh, let's that see. That was the plan, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I see that. <laughs> um, all right. Um, let's move on to the next talk. So as we said, um, Wei Yao Kei uh, from Los Alamos National Laboratory is the next speaker. Um, and he's going to talk about e-hygiene um, for final set interactions in EA. Uh, same spiel. Put your questions on Slack, please. All right. Wei Yao, please go ahead. Yeah. 
Yes, thank you. And uh, thank you for the invitation to, to, to let me talk at the Jazzscape Summer School again. Uh, and, and this time the topic is about uh, the hygiene event generator for final stage interactions in EA. And thanks for Xiaoxu, who has been doing a really good job of introducing all the very diverse physics that you can do and study at uh, EIC. But for this talk, we will go into a very specific topic is final state interactions of partons in the co-nuclear matter. And it also has some uh, 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 very close connected to uh, the jet quenching physics you probably already heard a lot during the, the jet skip summer school and maybe also practice a little bit on about the part energy loss physics and uh, for example, the, the quenching of hydrons and jets during the last two weeks. So, for this type of physics, we will primarily focus on the deep inelastic scattering region, where you uh, shoot an electron to the nucleus, and then it will uh, transfer a very large momentum transfer to the uh, partons inside the nucleus, and then knock out a quark, which then interact on its path with the uh, rest, uh, rest participant nucleons, sorry, rest uh, spectral nucleons of the, the whole nucleus. And the reason that we study the DIS process is that in the past it has provided us a lot of information of the proton structures and maybe help us to understand that there are actually two, two uh, the, the, the partonic structures in the protons. And now to generalize this DIS study, the electron nucleus collisions, we can learn a lot about the nuclear structures. And uh, regarding this uh, nuclear input, we will try to differentiate two effects. One is the intrinsic non productive input that are special to a nucleus. This will include, the, for example, nuclear structures and how the pattern distribution functions get changed in the nuclear environment. And there are, for example, some very recent extractions of the uh, not only this one-dimensional pattern distribution function, but also this uh, transverse momentum dependent PDF and the fragmentation functions using the global sets of uh, uh, data, including electronuclear collisions. But in addition to these non productive effects, there are also very important dynamic effects, and some of which may, may be modeled or calculated productively. And these are, uh, like we, uh, we, we, will, we, will, we, will, we will see in the later, including the dynamical shadowing of the collisions and how this particle shower developed in the environment of the nucleus and how the hydrons, if it's produced inside the nucleus, undergoes hydron interactions and collide with the target, and how the target dynamics modifies the whole picture. And the important thing about this dynamic effects that it can be process dependent. For example, in the DIS case, they show up as final state interactions, while in, for example, in drawing collisions, uh, in drawing productions, in PA collisions, we will have this uh, quark coming in and collide with uh, Antiquarking nucleus produce, uh, for example, WZ bosons. In this case, the uh, uh, co nuclear effect comes in the initial state. And we will try to, for, for, of course, understand these dynamic effects, which is critical to define what are actually our non productive input that we want to understand about the nucleus. And also, we seek to find some universality between the co nuclear properties in the initial state processes and in the final state process. And here is a schematic plot of the DIS limit of the EA collisions. So usually in the DIS, we will require that uh, the virtuality of this hard process Q square to be very large while we fixed the bureaucrat X. But in order for this picture that you have hard production and then followed by final state interactions, in order for this picture to hold, we actually need one more conditions. So, so in, this, uh, in this schematic, schematic plot, I draw this uh, hard process as a point. But, but when does this hard process is really localized in the nucleus, you can actually compute the spatial extent in the transverse direction of this hard process, which is just one over Q. And this is always smaller than the linear size of the nucleus. But in the longitudinal directions, because this virtual photon comes with a boost, you can compute what are the uh, longitudinal spatial extent of this virtual photon. And you turn, it turns out that it depends on the XB, the, the broken X of the process. And we will require that this 
longitudinal extent is also much smaller than nuclear size, which actually restrict our discussion here of this final state directions to the region of relatively large XB, actually XB larger than 0.1 over 8 to one third. So, and in this limit, we are, uh, it's meaningful to talk about uh, there are some final state interactions of the knockout parton interacting with the, the whole nucleus, which doesn't modify your production cross sections for the hard process. And for this final state interaction, we'll further consider that uh, in certain phase space or region of your observable, observables, they're actually dominated by partonic physics and they're mediated by global gluons, which primarily transfers transverse momentum uh, the, uh, between the medium and the jet. And they're also closely related to the transport properties of the co nuclear matter. For example, the, the Q hat parameter, which to first approximation measures a single parton, how much of transverse momentum broadness it gets per unit length of travel in the co nuclear matter. At, at this point, it may be useful to compare EA and the AA side by side. So there's one important difference is, is that uh, in AA collisions, especially when you focus on middle rapidities, the jet is almost deflected, the torque is deflected by 90 degrees, while the medium at middle rapidity, because you have uh, two uh, slab of matter coming up from each side, so the medium at this middle rapidity almost com comes to a complete stop in the longitudinal directions. So as long as you trigger on a hard Q or high PT processes, this hard time, time scale is always much smaller than the final state interaction time scale. On the other hand, in EA, the nuclear is also boosted. So that's why we actually need to, uh, to, to require it to select the bands with large XP for this separation of time scale to be uh, fulfilled. The Q hat, which characterizes the uh, stopping power of this plasma, is actually very large. At t equals 0.4 GeV, we we'll look at, for example, the extraction from jet, Jetscape collaboration. The Q hat parameter of the quark is almost 1 GeV square per Fermi. On the contrary, the co nuclear matter's Q hat is about two order of magnitude smaller than that. Another difference is, is that uh, in AA, you have a high temperature medium created in the middle, uh, in the initial stage, but it uh, has some very important real time dynamics. It expands very fast. Well, the cold nuclear matter is the ground state of the nucleus, is zero temperature and static. And this actually will compensate for some of the differences between Q height, so that the minimum modifications in the cold nuclear matter is actually not so small as compared to uh, what you would naively expect it from the drastic differences of the Q height parameter. And this is indeed what has been observed uh, in. In, in past experiments, all the way from EMC collaborations in the 90s to Hermes, and then to more recent uh, uh, class measurement at even lower beam energies. So here you can see that if you, uh, I should have put this uh, diagram over here. In the fixed target frame, you have an electron coming in, and then you measure the transverse momentum spectra and uh, as uh, the longitudinal moment fraction of the produced hydron. And it's just like what you do in the A collisions, you take this uh, ratio between the power of uh, uh, some inclusive production of a pion in EA collisions divided by electron neutron collisions. You can then divide, define this uh, nuclear modification factor. And as you can see, there are quite sizable modifications even in the co nuclear matter effects, uh, in, in the co nuclear matter. For example, if you look at this. Uh, longitudinal distribution of produced hydron, this modification to this fragmentation profile can be modified all the way to more than 50% in the large C region. And this e-hydrogen generator, whose full name is electron heavy ion jet interaction generator, is a model that aims to, to, to study this development of proton shower and energy loss effect and, and such effect in this electron ion collisions. So this is the general structure that I will introduce in the uh, rest of the talk. So this uh, e hydrogen generator is actually based on PCI, using PCI-8 to, uh, uh, to generate events in EP collisions without any medium effects. 
And in, EP, uh, in PCI AT1 generators, the hard processes is actually leading order. And you have two, you prepare two beams that's characterized by a, a <coughs> PDF or nuclear PDF. And they will trigger on this leading order hard processes. In EP collisions, you will have a partonic system that undergoes uh, QCD showers and eventually produce a bunch of shower hadrons. And will also combine the remnants uh, of the proton after knockout, not, not, not knockout of quark. And eventually, you combine the remnants and the proton shower system to form a color neutral system. And they will be handled by this uh, long string fragmentation model to, to perform hydronizations. And in e <coughs> hygiene, the key part is that uh, one can include the interactions between uh, the, the, the jet parton and small X content of the gluons and nucleus, which will both modify the development of the high virtuality proton shower and the fragmentation processes. So in the next few slides, I will introduce each of these blocks. So the first part is to actually uh, to model this jet medium interactions in the co-nuclear matter. So in A collisions, we have a good starting point that you have a, a, a so the first approximation of thermal system characterized by some temperature, and then you have the thermal distribution of all the protons in the, in the target. But in this case, it's the, t equal to, it's the t equals to zero system, and it's going to be, non, of course, non perturbative So we have to model what kind of, <coughs> what kind of momentum transfer we can get from this uh, forward scattering between the incoming quark and the, tar the, 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 the target. And there's one method to relate the, the, the forward scattering cross-section of this jet particle in the cold nuclear matter to the unintegrated gluon distributions in the nuclear target. This uh, unintegrated gluon distribution phi g is, depends on x of the gluon and the transverse momentum. And the forward scattering cross-section is directly proportional to that divided by kt squared up to some color factors. And of course, uh, what is the model that goes into this unintegrated gluon distribution is another assumptions. And from the kinematics, we can say that uh, this gluons that interact with the forward going jet has to come from the very small X content of the nucleus. And we will use the saturation motivated parameterization for the unintegrated gluon distributions. Notice that this is indeed a model, a very rudimentary model at the moment is that this distribution comes with a uh, parameterized X dependencies. At very large KT, I have this uh, typical one over KT square Coulomb tail, but at smaller KT, it is screened by a saturation scale that we introduced by hand. And this saturation scale is co um, computed so consistently by requiring that uh, it is given by the uh, gluon densities per unit areas in a certain uh, in a certain slab of nuclear matter of density rho and uh, uh, pass lens L. And on, on the right hand side, you can see what this uh, self-consistent procedure gives you for some fairly realistic thickness of a large nucleus and some parameterized uh, uh, longitudinal prof uh, 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 X profile. And for different Q square, you can actually compute what are the saturation scale that you, you have as a function of xb, and then put it back here to give you the forward collision cross section for the jet in the medium. This self-consistent uh, self determinant qs is actually also closely related to the jet transport parameter, because if you want to compute what are the uh, average kt broadening from all of these collisions, you just times kt squared and then do the average, you'll find that this q hat is just related to, up to some color factor, the saturation scale divided by the pass less. And, and from here, you can compute, the, uh, from, from the previous figure for the saturation scale, compute the, the jet transport parameters for different q square and different value of x. And with this uh, forward scatterings, you, 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 the next step is to include the medium-induced radiations. 
And this is very close you relate to the, it's a higher twist calculation, but also heard during the, uh, the, the, the jet quenching talk at, uh, at the summer school, is that in this DIS processes at ligand twist, you have this vacuum emissions of a gluon from this quark line, but at lex twist, if you include another interactions with the, between the jet part and the medium, this twist four contributions will modify this, uh, in medium uh, quark splitting functions to quarks and gluons. And recently, this has been uh, restudied by uh, Yuan Zhang and Xinian in one of their papers. And they obtained a, a so called generalized twist for calculations for this medium induced corrections. Uh, it comes with a fairly complicated form, but we will not use this full form. We will do some approximations. First of all, we will drop terms that are power suppressed by uh, the, the, the large NC in the large NC limit. And we'll also drop, uh, drop those power suppressed terms by the UV cutoff. And especially if they're actually not enhanced by any size effect of medium. And we'll only keep the main contributions that are actually medium enhanced uh, in a large nucleus. Another approximation is that we will first take the soft law emission limit which further simplifies this medium modified splitting function to a very compact form. In this case, this medium modified splitting function is still proportional to the vacuum splitting functions, is proportional to the forward scattering cross sections parameterized as the unintegrated gluon distribution. And finally, there's the interference factors for this jet radiation in the medium. And this interference effect, which depends on the formation time of the, the, the radiated gluon, it's actually called the Landau parameter Migdo effect. And it's a, a very important effect in finite size medium that strongly suppresses the radiation rate for uh, gluons with very long formation time. And in the past, we will further approximate this formula by power expanded this uh, interference term in terms of the inverse of the radiation, uh, radiation's transverse momentum before we perform the KT integration. But in this generalized higher twist, we will first perform this KT integration and then do the twist expansions. Uh, on the right-hand side, we, we do see some finite differences when uh, this transverse momentum of radiated gluons is not so, 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 it's not, it's, it's small. And whether you perform the expansion before or after the KT integration, look at some finite differences, but at large, uh, transverse momentum of the radiation where this approximation is supposed to work very well, you do see they, they, they agree for a very large range of phase space. And now you put this uh, multiple, uh, you, you put this uh, medium modified splitting functions into the uh, parton shower uh, to generate multiple emissions. And this multiple emission generation closely followed the media modified DGLAP evolution picture is that for the DCLAP evolution, you use this modified speed functions to modify both the evolution part and the initial condition of the evolutions. In terms of the event generator is that in the high virtuality part, if the, the split involves a large uh, separation of the, the transverse momentum of the two daughter partons, we directly added this uh, medium modified splitting part into the PCS splitting functions so that when PCS generates this KT outer parton shower, it will include this medium corrections, which can be either positive or negative, depending on the phase space. Well, at low virtualities, it will modify the initial condition for fragmentations. And for this, we will only use the medium modified part of the splitting functions and to generate additional gluon emissions from the part uh, from, from the part before it hypothesis through the long string fragmentation mechanism. And for this part, we'll actually use not the KT order shower, but the formation time order part of showers. And remember that the formation time is approximately the energy of the parton divided by the virtuality of the radiations. And because the medium induced radiations are very soft, the first approximations, you can think that this energy is, uh, it doesn't change too much. So this formation time order part of shower is kind of like the inverse virtuality order part of shower. And finally, 
to, 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 we will use again the lone strip fragmentation mechanism to perform hydronizations. And to do that in PCA, we have to ensure that the whole system is still color neutral. But now, because we have some additional uh, color exchange between the medium and the jet parton, we have to include more remnants from the recoil of, of this uh, 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 multiple interactions between the jet and medium. And here we will use a very simple model. We consider that for every interactions between the jet parton and another nucleons, it will break the nucleons into a quark and diquark system. And we will assign the quark and diquark the red color to keep the, 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 the system still in color neutral. And we'll put this additional remnants also into the final system for hydronizations. But of course, there's a problem because most of the medium interactions are already solved. This model will have to break down when you have uh, eventually for those very soft uh, momentum exchange where you, 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 you expect the partonic picture doesn't work so well. So here we can actually borrow some practices in heavy end collisions for the future, where again, you have this problem of a lot of the interaction between the object and the medium are very soft, and you may not have a single parton picture to describe what happens next. And the practice in heavy end collision is that you dump this very soft, this energy momentum contains in a very soft degrees of freedom back into your money body, uh, 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 more, uh, money body part of the model, in this case, the hydrodynamic modeling of the, the, uh, of the dynamics of the QGP, and then use this uh, money body physics model to describe what happens next and how this, uh, this soft degrees of freedom of energy momentum turns into hydrons. And this is something that we will like to try and we are actually doing something about this uh, right now in the hygiene to dump this soft energy momentum deposition back to the hydronic system. Okay, finally, I will show some results. Uh, so this is just a test of the PCI8, whether PCI8 can reasonably reproduce the fixed target measurements of hydron productions in e electron deuteron collisions. And this is for Hermes data. So for Hermes, you, you incident uh, an electron of about 27 GeV onto a fixed target of nucleus. And in this case, you can uh, measure the pion production and cam production in the forward side, and then define the fragmentation functions. And we find that we do need to uh, retune some of the PCS default parameters, especially what are the minimum mass for string to break to better <coughs> accommodate the, the description of the pion and cam fragmentation data. So this is for the one dimensional fragmentation structure. You can also measure the two-dimensional fragmentation structure, which depends on Z and the PT of the parton. And we find that after we fix the, the Z dependencies, the PT dependencies as modeled by PCA, it's non-productive modeling, uh, did quite a well job in describing the, uh, the PT spectra uh, at different Z bits. So in PCA, this non-productive modeling includes the primordial part KT inside the proton, and also the KT from the, 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 the hydronization processes. Now, if you include medium effects and take the ratio between the production of hydrons in EA collisions over uh, electron neutron collisions, you can define the nuclear modification factors. And here we compare uh, with some fairly reasonable parameters range that describe the data to the class measurement of pi plus productions. And as you can see from carbon, which is uh, have 12 nucleons to, to iron, I think it's 50, 56. And to light nucleus, you describe the, the, the evolution of this modification with the size of nucleus fairly reasonable. And for these two colors, it actually uh, it gives you a sense of how much differences you, you get from whether you use the original higher twist formulations or uh, this uh, generalized hard twist formulations, how much differences it gives you if, uh, if you define the, the expansion uh, more carefully. And then with the same parameters, you can move to Hermes energy, which are, uh, has slightly uh, higher incident lepton energy than the class uh, experiment. Uh, again, you see a, 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 
a, a good evolution, a, a good description of the evolution of the system size. But as you can see, this uh, differences between these two approximations start to, to diverge a little bit. You can also look at the transverse momentum spectrum. In this first plot, I only showed you the uh, transverse momentum spectra of pions, including only collisional effects, only those uh, uh, multiple collisions between jet and medium. And as you can see, with the same parameters that describes you the collinear modification modification of the collinear fragmentation function, only the collisional effect is not enough to describe uh, the broadening of the transverse momentum spectrum. But once you turn on radiations, it turns out that radiation actually contributes a, at least another 50% of the broadening to bring your uh, this broadening effect much closer to the data. So it seems that the medium induced radiation is not only modifies not only introduce energy loss, but its effect of recoil on the original hard part is very important to explain the transverse moment broadening in a large nucleus. <coughs> you can also study the hydron species dependencies, not only look at pi plus, but now pi zero, kion and proton antiprotons. Here you start to see some very interesting asymmetries between particles and antiparticles. At smaller z, this of the part, this, this, this hydrons moves very slowly in the nucleus, and sometimes you would, you expect that uh, the hydronic interactions, especially the differences between the, the cross sections between particle and antiparticles, when they collide with the nucleus, will start to matter. For example, the absorption cross section between a proton and antiproton from a nucleus can be very different, and we hope that after you have included the hydronic interactions between these hydrons and nucleus, but we can start to explain some of these uh, uh, more detailed features of these nuclear modifications at smaller z. At large z, we also see that the kion seems to not decrease so fast. And in the past, there are some ideas that we include some other contributions, for example, flavor conversions to explain these differences. But, but here I'm not going to too much of detail. So from fixed target, target experiments like Hermes and, uh, and class to collider energies for future EIC, what can we do? So the, the first advantage is that there is a huge increase of the kinematic reach. Of course, no, no, I'm, I'm not even putting the, the, the top collider energy for electron and light collisions. I think here it corresponds to square root of S equals to 43 GeV, but, but, uh, but, but you can already reach a much, much greater region in the coverage of Q square and XB. But of course, according to our previous analysis, we'll restrict this uh, final state interaction analysis to the large XB region. So here we will only restrict our discussion to XB greater than 0.01, and also to Q square much, much larger than saturation scale. So, so it's meaningful to say that you trigger on the hard process. And now you can do scan in this x and q square uh, phase space, for example, this five regions will correspond to the five plus over here and study very, in a very detailed way how the medium modifications evolve with xb and with q square to test your theory. The same can be done for the uh, transverse momentum spectrum. And in addition to that, you can also extract uh, the transport uh, the trans the transport parameters by measuring the transverse moment broadening of the leading parton. Uh, sorry, uh, 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 of the, the the produced hydrons. And in this uh, in this plot, I showed you this green line, which are actually leading order formula estimation. If if that you don't include any dynamical effects, just uh, e e e if you don't include any radiation effects, just what's your expectation from the pure collisions? And you can see that given the set of Q uh, saturation scale and the corresponding jet transport parameters, the leading order expectation of the transverse moment broadly actually smaller than the radiation, uh, than, than the simulation after you include radiations. So it's very important to understand this uh, shower developments in the nuclear matter 
to faithfully define what are the fundamental inputs you need for the conduct matter that characterize the transverse mountain rock. Excuse me. Um, yeah. Just wanted to mention you just have a couple minutes to wrap up, okay? Okay, yeah. That, that's the second to the last slide. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so, 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 so to summarize, right now the e hygiene focus on this uh, final state interaction limit, which we defined by large Q square and the large X, which is greater than uh, 0.1 divided by A to the one third. And in this case, final state interactions are completely factorized from the hard productions. Uh, the next step is we want to go to smaller X, uh, slightly smaller X while still maintaining large Q square. In this case, some of the collisions, multiple collisions may become coherent with the hard processes and will actually start to change the, the probability for your hard process to happen, and which is called dynamical shadowing. Of course, some of these dynamical shadowing effects, if you use, if you already use the nuclear PDF, may some of the inclusive effect is already included in the nuclear PDF, but there are still some final state effects, especially how this uh, uh, change of the, 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 the hard cross section is correlated with the final momentum broadening uh, has not been included in the event generator yet. And eventually, if you go to very small X, you enter the depot regime, and you, you need completely different picture and power counting to, to do the event generations. And I will leave my summary over here and uh, take your questions. OK, uh, Lauren, do you want to? Uh, yeah. OK, I didn't see any uh, questions posted on Slack, right? Were there? No, there's not, there aren't any. OK, so I think um, anybody who wants to ask questions can go ahead. Can I make a question to break the ice? Uh, put a, <laughs> ask a question to break the ice? Sure. Uh, so I, I, I'm always confused by what a twist is, and in <laughs> and maybe it di it differs from from who says it and and what the context is. So in on slide eight, for example, you say a twist is sort of one term in the one over LT squared expansion, right? Um, now on slide seven, I think it was you have a diagram that seems to imply that a higher twist is sort of a a higher term in a alpha s expansion, right? So because you have no additional gluons in there. So so what is a twist? So so twist uh, in, 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 in the in the textbook is always defined by this uh, uh, dimension minus uh, spin minus dimension definition. but but here, if you really look at this is is that uh, once you have a nucleus, and it have some other scales. For example, in the nucleus, you can have scales like uh, uh, momentum broadening or some screening mass, and then you have another hard scale. Then the twist is uh, in, in in its final effect is that you want to expand your cross sections to first orders of uh, power like that, like this. So it's like a one over Q square expansions. So for example, in this case, uh, you can either talk about twists in terms of observables because of course the spin function itself at this point is not an observable yet. For example, if you, if you plug in the spin functions, for example, into the computation of hydron productions, and then you can do the expansion at the very end, you will see that the, 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 the correction to the hydron productions goes like uh, Q hat. L <clears throat> over E. But, but this E is of course related to Q square of XB. And you may have some, some other terms if you expand also the screening mass uh, uh, like, like this. So, 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 so I think here I'm, we are using this uh, terms not, not at the level of the observables, but as level of event generators. Of course, at the event generators, uh, the, the Q square doesn't enter directly yet, so, so we will use the transverse momentum 
as approximation of the hard scale to do this inverse uh, expansions. But, but I, I think uh, the, the more formal definition is that uh, we, we should first define what type of observables we want to compute, and then the twist expansion is some final expansion on some observable effect. Here we're loosely using it at the level of spinning functions. So, so this this uh, you know interpreting it as an in expansion one over Q squared is sort of um, that's not the direct definition. It's sort of just a translation in some to some situation. Yes, yes. So as Abhijit also says, and you said, dimension minus maximum spin of the operator is what the twist is, and then that corresponds to different. Or you can you can formulate this in terms of different other expansions that are equivalent. Is that sort of how to take it? Like for example, one over Q squared or LT squared or um I think so. Of course, dimension will give you the Q square, uh, the, the spin will give you up to one power of different dimensions for quarks and gluons. But I think at least in this soft one emission limit, uh it always shows up as uh, one over Q squared for us. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I have to check the Slack again. There's nothing on Slack. Abhijit. Um, I think that was just a comment. Go ahead, Abhijit. Sorry. I didn't, oh, yeah, I, I didn't actually have a question. I'm I'm just uh just I, I think that I just thought the questions are over, so I just want to make an announcement. Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. Uh, uh so I just want to let everybody know uh if you look on the Slack channel. There is a survey. Uh, just, I wanted to get in at this point and say it because you know, people start leaving after a point. But there's a survey for the school in the general channel. Please fill it out uh, at your earliest convenience. And hopefully within this month, uh, the, the link will become inactive after a month. Um, and of course, you know, most of the it's about the school and, and your knowledge of the school will remain fresh in your mind or maybe a few days. Um, yeah, so please take the time and just, it just it's maybe it, it'll take no more than five minutes to fill out the survey. Uh, and there are lots of places where you can actually write comments on, on, on your suggestions for making the school better. Uh, please take that opportunity to write uh, as much as you like uh, about improving the school. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, I guess if there's questions, I mean, someone can still go ahead and ask, but otherwise I think we're at the break time. So I'll just pause for a few seconds if people want to ask more questions. And otherwise, I guess we'll see everybody back in 15 minutes. Oh, of course we should thank this. Yeah, thank you, Weya. Yeah. Yes, I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah, Th thank you, Weya. Okay, so we are for coffee now. Uh, we will be back in, uh, let me check the timeline. In, in 15 minutes, 15 minute break, if I remember right. Yeah, let me just quickly double check. Yeah, 15 minutes. Yeah, correct. So uh, see everybody back. We'll start, try to start promptly at uh, 1035 Eastern time. So. Sounds good. I'll, I'll pause. Okay, thanks for the reminder. <laughs> So Bjorn, I think we can go ahead and start if you want to do the introduction and then. Okay. Um, hi, Virginia, do you want to start sharing your screen first? Yeah, I'll go ahead and do that.
All right, that looks good. Um, okay, yeah, so let's get started again. Um, so our next invited speaker is Virginia Bailey from Georgia State University, and she will give us an update on the status of S Phoenix. Please go ahead. All right, thank you. Um, I'm really excited to be here today and talk to you about uh, the status of the S Phoenix experiment. Um, it's a really exciting time for us because we're in the midst of our very first uh, commissioning run um, at RIC. And so today I'm gonna show you sort of some uh, stuff about the detector and our physics program, but also um, some, some plots from the first real data that we've gotten in S Phoenix. So it's a very exciting time for us. Um, so before I get into the detector, I wanted to sort of motivate the design by going uh, through the S Phoenix physics program. Um, so the sort of overall goal of the of the S Phoenix program is to study probes of the QGP so that we can understand uh, the, the small scale structure of the QGP. And so we look at a variety of probes where we're able to vary different aspects of those probes and understand how they interact with the QGP. So looking at things like jet structure, where you can vary both the, the momentum scale of the probe as well as the angular scale of the probe, looking at uh, things like the substructure, um, looking at things like quarkonia, specifically uh, looking at the, the upsilon states where you're actually varying the size of the probe. Um, and then looking more generically at parton energy loss where you can vary um, the momentum and then especially looking at heavy flavor where you can vary the mass of the probes. Um, and then finally, uh, we also have a lot of interest in cold QCD physics, um, looking at things like proton spin, transverse momentum, and, and nuclear effects. So with all of those uh, physics goals in mind, um, we designed and built the first new detector at RIC in over 20 years. Um, so here is a uh, diagram of what the S-Phoenix detector actually looks like. Uh, so starting from the inside, we have a number of tracking detectors. So uh, the very closest to the beam pipe, there's the, the MAPS-based vertex tracker or MBTX. Uh, and then outside of that, the uh, intermediate silicon tracker the, or the INPT. So these two are silicon trackers. Uh, then outside of that, there's a time projection chamber as well as um, an additional uh, tracking detector outside of that, which is the, the TPC outer tracker. And all of these work together to reconstruct tracks, which uh, are coming from charged particles that bend within the 1.4 Tesla magnetic field uh, provided by our solenoid uh, magnet, um, which sits out here. And then we have uh, three different calorimeter systems. So we have both an electromagnetic calorimeter, um, which sits inside the uh, magnetic field as well as a two-part hadronic calorimeter, um, one part that sits inside the, the magnet and one that sits outside of the magnet. Um, and this is really exciting because this is actually the first uh, hadronic calorimeter at MOOC Rapidity at RIC. And so S Phoenix is really the first detector at RIC that's going to be able to measure um, both the electromagnetic and hadronic components of things like jets. Um, we also, uh, of course, because we want to study all of these probes of the QGP, we need to have a really high rate de data acquisition and trigger system to allow to collect high statistics data, um, especially for rarer probes. Um, and so uh, S Phoenix has uh, actually a, a hybrid readout system. So um, we have this 15 kilohertz uh, trigger readout um, which can be triggered using either uh, sort of a minimum bias trigger, um, or we also uh, have triggers for things like jets, um, which are especially important for proton-proton collisions. Um, and then the tracking detectors actually uh, can, be read, can be read out in uh, streaming mode. Um, so rather than taking data at a, at a triggered uh, rate, you can actually stream all of the data um, and this allows for a huge improvement in statistics. So if you think about something like low PT heavy flavor in proton-proton collisions, um, it, 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 it can be hard to trigger on. And so with this streaming readout, we can get two orders of magnitude more statistics um, for these types of observables, which is really important, especially as uh, to, to collect a high uh, statistics reference um, for some of our observables in gold-gold collisions. 
Um, and then finally, there's a number of event characterization detectors. Uh, so these are looking at sort of the global properties um, of the, the collisions. So we have a minimum bias detector, which sits in this forward region here um, and is used as the minimum bias trigger uh, for, for our collisions. Um, and then we have uh, an event plane detector here, uh, which is sort of this sort of pizza looking uh, uh, detector uh, that you can see the little slices of. Um, which is, does exactly what it sounds like. It measures event plane angles. Um, and then finally, not pictured here because it's, it's sort of down along the beam pipe in the tunnel, uh, we also have a zero degree calorimeter, which can measure uh, spectator neutrons. So SKNX has a, a nominal three year run plan. Um, so we're in the middle of the, the 2023 run, which is really designed for commissioning of the detector. Um, and sort of getting everything running with RIC um, and our, our data operations, uh, taking gold gold data. And then next year in 2024, we'll take our high statistics proton proton data, which can be used uh, as a reference for a lot of the measurements we want to do in gold gold collisions, um, as well as uh, can be used for, for cold QCD measurements. Um, as, and also proton gold collisions that can also be used um, to do these cold QCD measurements. Um, and then in 2025, this is when we uh, will take our high statistics gold gold data set um, to do all of the, the really exciting measurements that I'm gonna talk about uh, later on in this talk. So I showed you a, a diagram of S Phoenix, but this is the, the real S Phoenix detector. Um, so this is uh, two pictures, one sort of the side view of S Phoenix, um, so you can see the carriage and some of the electronics racks on the side. Um, and then here a picture of the bore of S Phoenix, so you can see uh, the tracking detectors, which just kind of look like a bunch of cables coming out of the tracking detectors, really. Um, and then here uh, you have the electromagnetic calorimeter and outside of that the hydronic calorimeters um, and the magnet. Um, and so the detector is now fully assembled and uh, commissioning is underway at, at Brookhaven. Um, and so in the next slides, I'm gonna show some uh, more details on the various subsystems, as well as first looks at real S Phoenix data. So I'm gonna start out with some of the uh, event characterization uh, detectors. So here's a picture of the, the zero degree calorimeter uh, sitting down in the tunnel um, along the beam pipe here. Um, and as I mentioned before, this measures uh, spectator neutrons from, from the collisions. So here we can see um, a couple of plots from, uh, from the data um, uh, doing the correlation between the south side and the north side. So one on either side of the, of the detector. Um, you can see this nice correlation between the two where we're getting sort of the, the spectator neutrons from these uh, collisions of gold gold. Um, and then if you look at a, a 1D projection of this, you can see actually um, that we can resolve a single neutron peak. So one single neutron hitting, hitting the ZDC here. Um, so then the next event characterization uh, detector here that I am showing is the minimum bias detector. So this is the MBD. This is actually reused um, from Phoenix. So if people are familiar with, with the Phoenix detector, uh, this was the, the Phoenix beam beam counter. It's basically just a bunch of photo tubes um, and can be used for uh, doing measurements of things like centrality, uh, as well as uh, being the minimum bias uh, trigger. Um, the ZDC I, I forgot to mention, but also is the same ZDC that was also used in Phoenix. So there's a little bit of repurposing done uh, in S Phoenix. Um, and here at the bottom, you can see a plot again from real data. This is the correlation between uh, the uh, signal in the ZDC and the MBD. Um, and so you can see it's got this sort of usual uh, banana shape, people like to call it. Um, and then finally, uh, for event characterization, we have the SEPD. So I pointed out that it kind of looked like a pizza. Uh, and here's one of those slices. Um, and so each of these, uh, sections that you see here are, are read out separately um, so that we can measure the, the energy um, and, and sort of the azimuthal variation of the energy to reconstruct uh, event plane angles. Um, and this is actually uh, almost identical to the EPD that's used in STAR. So if people are familiar with that, they're very similar. 
Um, and one of the really cool things coming out of the, the commissioning was that the uh, SEPD was installed one day and this plot was actually made that night. So the very, very first uh, data coming from the uh, EPD, you can see here um, a nice MIP peak and a few of the channels from the EPD um, showing that it you know, is working as expected. So moving on to the, the calorimetry. So here is a picture of the outer HCal. So this is the same detector that I showed in the previous pictures, but with a lot less stuff in it. Um, because this was before everything was installed and this was only a year and a half ago. So actually uh, the, the installation of S Phoenix has been quite quick. Um, and so you can see here the, the outer HCal and then inside of that is the magnet. Um, and uh, the outer HCal is made of uh, layers of scintillating tiles and um, steel. Um, and be, uh, in addition to taking uh, data with with beam, we've also taken a lot of cosmic ray data with the outer HCal and also the inner HCal. Um, and so here you can see uh, the data points in black uh, compared to a simulation of cosmic muons. Um, and you can see that they agree pretty well. Um, and this is actually really key because this is a, a, a part of our calibration scheme for the uh, hadronic calorimeters. Um, and then on the bottom, you can see a correlation of the energy that we measure in the outer HCal uh, compared to uh, the charge that is measured in the MBD um, event by event. So you see a nice correlation. We're really measuring the same events in our two detectors, showing us that technically everything is working well. Um, so here now is the inner HCal. So this has a very similar design to the outer HCal. It has uh, the same scintillating tiles, uh, this time layered with aluminum absorber. Uh, and so you can see a cool picture from the installation. They actually built the entire inner HCal and then just sort of slid it into inside of the magnet. Uh, so this was a really cool process. Um, and of course, we've taken a lot of data with both the inner and outer HCal. So here's an event display of a, a real collision uh, where you can see the energy deposits in the inner HCal in red and energy deposits in the outer HCal in blue. And of course, we see the expected good correlation between the two detectors. Um, then the last part of the calorimetry is the electromagnetic calorimeter. Uh, so this is made of tungsten blocks that are embedded with scintillating fibers. Um, and so it's really designed primarily for measurement of, of uh, things like photons and electrons. Um, and so, of course, one of the first photon measurements that you might want to do is looking at, at the diphoton mass distribution. Um, and so here is a, a measurement with a, a little less than 60,000 events. Um, in the EMCAL that's showing the diphoton mass distribution, and we see this peak, which is our sort of expected pi zero peak. Um, and so this is really great that we see it and also is really a key um, part of the, the calibration plan for the electromagnetic calorimeter. So moving on to the tracking systems. So uh, the four tracking systems really work uh, together to be able to measure the um, different aspects of, of tracks. Um, so each one sort of contributes something special uh, to, to the fully reconstructed tracks. So starting from the inside, we have the, the MVTX, this maps based vertex tracker. Um, so this is actually based uh, on, sim on a similar design to the uh, Elise uh, inner tracker. Um, and you can, and, and we have really um, fine spatial resolution for the MVTX, which allows for very precise vertexing. Um, so that's why it's called the, the vertex uh, detectors because it, it has this very uh, precise vertexing. Um, and then outside of that is the INTT, this intermediate silicon tracker. And this tracker has a little bit uh, more granular spatial resolution, but it has very fine timing uh, precision. And so uh, it, it provides really the timing information for these tracks that we reconstruct, uh, which is especially key for doing things like rejecting pileup. Um, then outside of that, we have sort of the largest part of the, the tracking system, which is the time projection chamber. So this is a, a chamber filled with gas. 
um, and the, the charged particles are going to ionize that as they pass through and as they bend within, within the uh, magnetic field, you can then measure the, the momentum of the track. And so uh, this is really uh, the, the big momentum uh, measurement for our tracking. And then finally, we have the TPC outer tracker, or the teapot. Um, and this sits actually, you can see here, it kind of slides into the EM cal, the inside of the EM cal. Um, and this really provides this additional point uh, outside of the TPC, which is um, really important for doing calibration because we need to have this, this sort of additional point um, to be able to correct for the, the distortions that we expect to have within the TPC. So here's a, a couple of plots from uh, commissioning of the tracking detectors. So, so on the top here, I'm showing hits in a uh, real collision um, in S Phoenix in the TPC. You might notice that all of the tracks look very straight. This did not have the magnetic field on when you uh, when we took this data, which is why they don't bend. Um, but you can see that the the TPC is able to you know get hits, and we can see things that look like tracks. Um, then on the bottom, I have a couple of correlation plots. So on the left here is the correlation between the INTT and the teapot. So this is the uh, the detector that sits just inside the TPC and the detector that sits just outside of the TPC. Um, and so you, you can see good correlation there. Um, and then on the right is the correlation between the teapot and the MBD. Um, and this one is especially interesting because this is one of the first uh, looks that we have at actually correlating these different systems that have uh, uh, the different readout systems, right? So the, the teapot is one of the tracking detectors. It has this um, readout that allows for streaming readout and the MBD is, is sort of got the same readout as the calorimeter, it's just triggered. Um, and so being able to correlate these different uh, readouts is really important for sort of the technical um, checks on, on our, our data readout. So that was uh, about sort of the, the detector in our stat uh, commissioning status. Um, so now I wanted to go into a little bit more detail about S Phoenix physics program and the projections for uh, the types of, of measurements that you should expect in the coming years. Um, so I'm going to show a number of projections based on uh, the, the statistics that we expect to have for these different physics measurements um, in the coming years. So as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, jet physics is one of the, the really important goals for S-Phoenix. Um, it's, you know, why we designed the detector to have, uh, you know, electromagnetic and hadronic calorimetry uh, with wide acceptance. Um, and so here I'm showing a couple of plots of the projections just as yields of jets um, on the, the left here for both proton-proton and for central gold-gold collisions. Um, and then on the right here is the projected uh, RAA, uh, assuming these statistics from the plot on the left. So you'll notice a couple of things about this. Um, first of all, that we expect to have jet measurements up to a reasonably high PT, where you start to have overlap with measurements that have been done at the LHC. So you're able to really compare uh, directly the, the measurements at RIC and the LHC. Um, but also we expect to really, uh, really have a nice precision as you go to low PT jets, um, where the measurements that have been done at the LHC, right, they, it, it becomes more and more difficult to measure low PT jets just because of the higher energy collisions that are happening there. Um, and so really where, uh, where we benefit is at this low PT region where we can do really precise measurements. Um, and you'll also notice that I'm showing uh, some, uh, some projections for also uh, direct photons here, um, where we can use these for looking at things like photon jet measurements, um, as well as a, a projection of charged hadrons, which can be used for things like looking at fragmentation functions or jet substructure. Um, and so we expect to have a lot of statistics for these types of measurements. Um, so I picked out a couple of measurements that I think uh, we can really learn something new at S Phoenix. Um, and I sort of wanted to highlight uh, in this talk. So the first one is sort of trying to understand what the path length dependence of energy loss is, right? So, um, People at this school presumably are very interested in sort of modeling of, of uh, energy loss. 
And so um, one of the open questions is, okay, well, you expect that the jet loses energy relative to how much QGP it sees, but is that uh, the only effect? Is there other effects coming from the structure of the jet or are there fluctuations in this? And so trying to understand this is, is one part of the puzzle. Um, and one way that you can really get to this is by looking at the V2 of jets, where you're basically correlating the energy loss that you see with that initial geometry um, to understand the path length dependence. And so on the right here, what I'm showing is uh, a summary of measurements from the LHC, both for jets and high PT hadrons. Um, and you see that there's a good precision, especially going to, to high PT. Um, for these measurements from the LHC. Um, but where S Phoenix can really contribute is going to this low PT region, um, where we're, we would really be able to constrain models of path length dependence of energy loss for jets that are actually much closer to the sort of the, the scale of the QGP medium itself um, at this lower PT region. Um, another interesting question that has been uh, discussed a lot, especially in recent years, is uh, sort of the R dependence of energy loss. So looking at um, going to, to larger radius jets, you can have these sort of competing effects, right? So if you increase the size of your jet, you're recovering more out of cone energy loss. Um, you're uh, including more of the medium response. Um, but at the same time, we expect that jets that have wider splittings uh, will, on average, lose sort of more energy than those that are more collimated. Um, and so I think that it's important that models really need input from experiment to be able to balance these different effects um, that they're putting into their models. Um, and actually, at the, the results currently from the LHC, there's a bit of tension between these results at, at low PT. And where S Phoenix can contribute is exactly in that region of tension. Um, where we expect to have uh, nice precision measurements in this low PT region um, of the, the, the radial dependence of energy, radius dependence of energy loss. Um, and since this is the Jetscape school, of course, I can't uh, not show a Jetscape plot. Um, so here's a, a nice uh, prediction from Jetscape uh, for this exact type of measurement, looking at uh, the RAA for different Rs um, for jets. And you can see that Jetscape actually doesn't predict any strong R dependence to the RAA. Um, and I also wanted to highlight that this uh, this prediction is actually from um, this paper um, showing here on the on the right, which was based on a, a workshop that we had uh, about one year ago, um, where we brought together uh, experimentalists from S Phoenix and people from the theory community, and really had. Um, a discussion about uh, physics projections for S Phoenix and these particular um, observables that we want to measure and um, the, the predictions for those observables. Um, and so there's a nice summary paper uh, that was put together after this uh, workshop with some of these uh, predictions. So I've gone over a couple of jet measurements, but of course, uh, S Phoenix has a really wide ranging jet program that we're interested in. Um, so I didn't get a chance to talk about everything. Um, I mentioned at the beginning uh, that, that uh, S Phoenix is going to have a lot of uh, ability to measure direct photons, um, especially with our, our EMCAL. Um, and so here you can see uh, projections for doing things like photon jet measurements. Um, as well as die jet measurements. Um, and of course, one of the really pillars of the S Phoenix physics program is looking at jet substructure, um, especially combining sort of our, our calorimeter information and, and tracking information to be able to look at the structure within a jet. And then one more knob that you can turn um, on jets is looking then changing the mass of that initiating parton, so looking at heavy flavor jets. Um, so here I'm showing a couple of projections for uh, single B jets, um, as well as die B jets, where actually you can sort of uh, further narrow the, the physics process that's uh, producing these B jets um, and reduce the, the contribution from gluon splitting. So you get sort of a little bit of a different um, uh, physics message from this. Um, and really trying to understand the mass dependence of energy loss. And S Phoenix is really designed to do these types of measurements um, using our very precise tracking and vertexing, uh, where you can actually reconstruct the, the secondary vertices 
um, and be able to, to tag heavy flavor um, stuff using using this um, type of type of analysis. Um, jets aren't the only way that you can look at, at heavy flavor. So here's a couple of projections looking at open heavy flavor physics um, for uh, Bs and D zeros, looking at the RAA on the, the left and the V2 on the right. Um, so here you can, of course, um, uh, similarly to the B jets, right, you can use this really precision tracking and vertex reconstruction um, to be able to tag these heavy flavor uh, particles. And um, the, the nice thing about heavy flavor is that the mass is so large of these quarks that they're prim produced primarily in the early in the hard scattering. Um, and so they really uh, can probe the full evolution of the QGP. Um, and that way we can, we can study the mass dependence of collectivity and of energy loss um, as shown in, in the projections. And uh, this will help to provide constraints on the diffusion transport parameters of the QGP. Um, I mentioned at the beginning uh, the interest in quarkonia, especially the, the epsilon states. So S Phoenix will have really excellent mass resolution for doing these uh, measurements in the dielectron channel, uh, allowing for actually the, the separation of the three epsilon states. Um, so, uh, you know, the models really predict this sort of uh, increased suppression as you go from the 1s to the 2s to the 3s states. Um, and so we'll be able to really test these models uh, by, by being able to, to separate out these different states. Um, and you can see the projections here along with a recent result from STAR, uh, which was able to separate out the 1s and 2s and put an upper limit on the 3s um, uh, suppression. And so it will be really uh, interesting to see how the S-Phoenix uh, measurement compares to these uh, results from STAR. And then finally, I talked mostly about uh, measurements in gold-gold collisions, but of course, S Phoenix also has a lot of interest in small systems. Um, so here I'm showing a couple of uh, either plots of V2. On the left is looking at um, D0 flow. Um, so looking at sort of the heavy flavor flow and, and understanding collectivity in small systems, um, where you can see a, a nice improvement from a similar measurement uh, that has been done in Phoenix. Um, and then also on the, the right here, I'm showing um, the V2 for jets or, or hadrons um, in P-Gold, where you can study things like you know, cold nuclear matter effects um, and cold QCD spin measurements, as well as understanding um, a potential uh, for energy loss actually in small systems um, that you might be able to see looking at the, at the V2. So that brings me to the summary. Um, so the S Phoenix detectors uh, provides this full coverage um, electromagnetic and hadronic calorimetry uh, in full azimuth out to plus or minus 1.1 in pseudo rapidity, as well as high precision tracking and vertexing and a really fast readout rate, um, all of which, which uh, will allow for high statistics samples of hard probes, things like jets, photons, um, hadrons, heavy flavor probes, um, and, and produce complementary measurements to those that have been done, especially at the LHC. Um, the measurements then can, of course, help us to improve our understanding of small scale behavior of the QGP, especially when comparing this with models and trying to, to use it to extract parameters from models. Um, and actually our commissioning with BEAM only began uh, on May 18th. So that was the day we got the official approval to operate as Phoenix. Um, and so we've really made significant progress in just uh, the last 10 weeks. Um, and we're looking forward to having first physics measurements uh, hopefully soon, so thank you. Hey, thank you. I I didn't see any. Uh, maybe there's a question on Slack. I'm not sure. Yeah, there was one by okay. Raghav. Uh, maybe you want to ask it yourself. If if not, oh, yeah. I lost my Slack. Okay, uh, I lost my Zoom actually. Which oh, you mean the question from someone else that was posted? Uh. Maybe I don't know. Uh, it was under your name, so there was a question. Why does ah yeah 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 right right. right. Sorry sorry yeah. This was from Swapnesh who posted it in a different Slack channel for some oh, reason. Okay, okay. I think this was uh, 
he was asking, why is the RA showing flat lines? I think this was your projection plot, Virginia. Uh, yeah, so so these are these are projections. Um, so what the the goal of these types of plots is really to um, not show sort of physics results, but to show the statistical power um, that we expect to have based on the the um, the the sort of acceptance of S Phoenix and our expected uh, uh, statistics that we'll collect during the three year running period. Yeah, I think that's good. Um, I don't see any other questions on Slack. So we have other questions here. Raise your hand. Maybe in the meantime, one quick question. Uh, is S Phoenix interested in also running other small systems like oxygen oxygen? Would that be interesting for the you know energy loss in small system studies, for example? Yeah, so definitely um, if there's an opportunity, especially to go beyond the, the three-year run program that we currently um, have, I think there's a lot of interest um, for running also small systems like Oxygen Oxygen um, in S Phoenix. It's sort of, the timelines are sort of tight because of course yeah. the EIC wants to come in, um, but if there's an opportunity, I think S Phoenix definitely has interest. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. People were a lot less shy in the first talk. <laughs> Everyone's already exhausted. Um, so any other questions, please raise your hand. I don't see any. Lauren, I guess we can then go ahead right should we go ahead with the next talk or i guess we may as well right i think so i don't know what the yeah. time scale is where are we well first we should thank our speaker of course <laughs> thank you virginia thank you thank you um... Yeah, we have like five minutes, I guess we're a bit early. But from my side, I think it's okay if we... I think so. It's recorded if someone, you know, misses the beginning because they join late or something, they can... Can I, can I share my slides? Yes, you should be able to if you want to go ahead and uh, okay. try. Okay, yes, they came up. Yeah, let me just check something. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay, I guess I do the introductions. So <laughs> the next speaker. Yeah, can I just ask, sorry, before you start, but how many slides do you have? Uh, I think around 30, so. Okay, just so I know if I need to give you a reminder on the time <laughs> oh uh, i think i'll be okay on top of the time but i mean if it's if i'm taking too much i'll cut it it's for it's okay okay thanks okay so our next invited speaker is joao barata from brookhaven national lab and he's going to tell us about part one energy loss in inhomogeneous matter please go ahead uh, okay first of all let me thanks for the to need to speak in this school and you know, for all the people that stayed till the end of the school to listen to my talk. So as Bjorn said, I'll talk uh, today about some, some recent ongoing work on uh, describing evolution of sensor of jets in, 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 the, in the QGP, but taking into account the fact that the QGP has some, is, is not a homogeneous uh, background. So this this work has I mean has been going on with with many people with a series of papers and some other papers that I didn't list, and yeah, it, and it was I should say mostly started by by my collaborator Andre, uh, which which started working on this some years ago with with uh, with people from Los Alamos. So okay, so maybe let me start from kind of 
very basic picture. So I, I try to, since this is a school, to make it uh, a bit more accessible than, than than usual. So there will be less equations. But uh, okay, so we know uh, that, for example, in PP events, that you know jets are very common final states that we see in these type of experiments, and this is a very famous plot where we see a jet uh, being produced. So jets are these very collimated space of particles that are then measured uh, at the end as this uh, very uh, co collimated uh, energy deposit in, 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 the, in the detectors. And but when you go to, to FDI and things are a bit more complicated, so you still have uh, jets being produced, but of course, uh, avians are a very busy environment. And on top of that, you see all of this uh, soft radiation that fills up the detector. And you can ask what happens to jets in, in this type of experiments. And typically, the modifications are kind of uh, generically illustrated in this plot. So, on, for example, on this jet event, you see on, the, on one side a, a jet which is still very energetic and quite collimated. But if you look on, on the other side, you will see that the jet now is slightly deviated in, in, in this angle. So it's not really uh, pi. But more importantly, uh, you, you can observe that the jet is much broader, meaning that the particles of the jet have been pushed uh, uh, away from the jet axis. And more importantly, the energy that is deposited in, 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 this, in this detector is much less than, than the other side. So usually we call this this uh, the quenching of the jet and also the fact that the jet gets fatter, it's called the broadening. Okay, so, and and of course, since uh, I mean, we, are, we are doing theory here, what we want to understand is how do this, uh, what are the underlying processes that give you this kind of uh, phenomena? So the very cartoon, the, I mean, the basic cartoon picture of what is happening here is what I tried to draw here. So essentially, we still have this kind of initial art process that is the same as in, in, in normal collisions because it's really uh, short scale physics. And then you have also the evolution of the usual uh, virtuality, virtuality cascade. But what happens now is that the partners inside the jet will interact with the, with the constituents of the, of the QGP or, or, or the matter. So usually what happens, as I mentioned, is that when you interact, you change the, the momenta of the particles in, in, in the medium. And because of this, you have the, the deviation essentially from, from the axis of, of the jet. And also because you are, uh, you are pushing or you are accelerating color charges, this will, will make them uh, produce some radiation, which at the end will contribute to this uh, quenching of the jet or this energy loss effect. Okay, and in theory, of course, our task is to describe these processes and then uh, relate these modifications at the level of observables that you can measure in, in, in an experiment. And today I will mainly discuss how, how this comes more on the side of uh, describing these effects uh, computational-wise. Okay, so um, I'll not describe in detail these calculations, but let me just tell you kind of the basic assumptions that go in all of the calculations that go in this field. So first of all, there is um, there is an underlying assumption that the jet is highly energetic, and this allows you to to perform these uh, these calculations in some Aquano limit, meaning that uh, you neglect uh, corrections which goes as as powers of one of over the uh, one over the the jet energy, uh, and in jet quenching uh, the one particular uh, particular point is that this is true up to particular corrections which scale as uh, the length of the medium, which are kept. Um, so these these corrections are kept because even though they are suppressed by the the energy of the jet, they are enhanced by the the length of the medium, and because of this, this can be large. And more importantly, this this type of corrections are important to properly describe the production of radiation inside uh me mediums which have don't have uh, l equal to zero uh, from the matter side the um, the usual approximation that we use is that the medium can be described in terms of some classical field which uh, mathematically means something of this sort so you say that the gauge field for, for the i mean the gluon gauge field can be uh, expanded in terms of some classical part and then the quantum the, the, and then some quantum piece that you keep uh, if you want to track for example the production of radiation and then this, this classical part is treated in such a way that the, the correlations of this of the of this field are treated to be Gaussian, meaning that this is only non-trivial correlator. And on top of that, you assume that the correlations are local in space and all the other uh, indices. 
Okay, so the typical picture that we have is that we have uh, the particles of the jet are moving at very large, with very large energies along the, the, the uh, let's say the X plus light cone or the direction of the light cone, while the medium can be in some limit for this uh, traveling uh, along the other direction of the light cone. And so all interactions between the jet and the medium are kind of localized in this uh, small region. Okay. Uh, even if you do these approximations, it's quite hard to, I mean, these calculations are quite still quite difficult. So for most, uh, so for mo most phenomenological applications are, uh, are based on uh, leading order calculations for the basic processes. So this being the, just the evolution of a single particle in the medium, which is uh, the, the leading order uh, calculation, of course. And then the next one being the production of radiation in the medium, which is what is important if you care about energy loss. Uh, so, this very simplifying assumptions is what goes into all the formalisms that uh, that people use in 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 jet quenching uh, in jet quenching phenology, and that were we'll discussed, I guess, in, in other talks. But uh, although these calculations are important because they give you some sense of the important scales and processes that, that I mean, in, in effects that that go into this into this. Uh, into this type of physics, the problem is that you lose sensitivity to most of the medium properties since they come as, since they are added into the corrections to this this type of approximations. So of course you can wonder, you know, why why do you want why should you want to go beyond this? So of course I mean, uh, I mean as usual perturbative calculation in QCD you want to go beyond because you know we, usually the leading order calculation is not enough. But on top of that, as I mentioned, there will be power corrections and subite corner corrections which will be uh, connected to properties of the medium which cannot appear at, at the leading order uh, at, at leading order and this is of course important because as you go deeper and try to describe the, the structure of jets in more detail as, as for example for jets structure calculations and measurements or if you want to describe the structure of the medium through jets then uh, these terms can be important since they can either be um, you know they can give reasonable um, they can give you like a, important contribution, or in fact, it can be a leading order effect depending on, on the observable that you are looking at. Okay, so today, as, as I mentioned in my topic, in my title, uh, I will talk about a particular correction uh, of this type, which has to do with the fact that you, that the matter in, in that you, that the jet is traversing is not completely isotopic. So why, why do I want to talk about this? So as I mentioned in the beginning, in all of these calculations, there is a starting assumption Okay. which is that the, the medium is essentially an infinitely large brick of matter, and this matter is static, uh, it doesn't have any structure. And of course, it's a very bad approximation, you know, uh, naively to the quark quantum plasma, because we know that the quark quantum plasma uh, has very large uh, at initial uh, gradients, and it, it expands, uh, uh, it, it, it explodes essentially, and of course, this is very far from having a static medium. So ideally, we would like to do the calculations as not assuming this type of geometry, Secondly, um, we know that the coupling between the, the matter and, and the jet is, is important uh, for some phenomena. So, for example, for a medium response, which is this uh, generically this effect that the, the jet will act as a current on, on top of the medium, which will excite the medium, and then these particles that, that get excited can populate the jet. But of course, this effect doesn't happen on its own. It's, it's really coupled to also to the modifications of the medium to the jet. And these two, two things are coupled to each other in, and you cannot really separate them. I mean, uh, unless you, of course, are only interested in studying some particular effect. And this, this type of correction that I'll talk about come on, on this side of, of this plot. Uh, finally, the kind of the last point why this, this matter is because, I mean, a long time ago, uh, people also tried to look into this. So this is a very old paper, but essentially the idea was to study uh, how jets behave when you kind of uh, turn, uh, evolve them in a medium which has some some flow, but the problem is that all of these calc previous calculations were done in um, a, more at a level of like some phenological input where you modify some 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 in medium cross sections such that you kind of capture this type of effects. But of course, uh, I mean as uh, as we showed in, in these papers, this type of modification is not really justifiable from from kind of more first principle calculations in 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 quantum field theory so what i what i will explain today to you is how to do these calculations for all the processes that i mentioned before and then i will show you some uh, some simple results for some standard uh, jet observables 
using all of these calculations. Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about is uh, momentum broadening uh, in the medium when the medium is not isotropic. So momentum broadening can be studied at the level of just shooting a single parton through a, a brick of matter and looking at the final distribution of, of, of this object. And here is a summary of the calculation. So we start with some initial distribution for a collection of uh, for, for a single particle. And then we shoot it through a medium, which has some direction where there is an anisotropy, which I will denote as this gradient of temperature, meaning you can think of it as the medium becoming more denser in this direction compared to, to this side, okay? And then the medium is assumed to have some finite length. And then what you want to know is, starting from this distribution, what is the final distribution in momentum of this particle? And in particular, this will be described by some um, by some angle, which tells you essentially if this uh, distribution is isotropic or not. So in the in the usual case where this distribution is is evolving in a in an isotropic plasma, this the dependence there is no dependence on this angle. Okay, so before giving you some just some picture of how this calculation is done, let me just describe to you how, how we treat the medium. So as I said, the medium is treated as a classical field, which uh, diagrammatically what it means is that if you imagine, for example, a, a, a quark that belongs to the jet interacts with the medium through some gluon with some you know with some uh, quasi particle in the medium in practice what is done is that we truncate this diagram and replace all of these lower vertex by some external field and since the external field is classical you can always write it as some uh, incoherent sum over some uh, over the um, kind of the, the the potentials generated by each one of these particles in the medium and then because you work in the we are working in the limit where the um, we don't care about uh, uh, one of one over energy corrections to to this uh, calculation you can assume that there is no energy exchange through this uh, gluon okay so all of this interaction is really just in the transverse momentum of the particle and yes and the in general the way we describe these potentials is is, is a phenomenological model but what matters is that the the structure of this of these uh, v's will go as one over the the transverse momentum squared of of of, of the gluon, so it's like a, a t gluon exchange, and then it is regulated by some screening mass, which tells you which is just uh, you can interpret as the device screening mass in the medium, and then the important fact is that since this is now a stochastic field, and as I said, it's in the most calculations it is, it is assumed to have Gaussian statistics. It means that essentially when you uh, do an average over the field configurations of this medium, uh, it and since you assume that the interactions are completely local, it means that all the um, all the exchanges are local in color space and also in all the other uh, indices. So for example, at the level of diagrams, it means that, for example, if you have an interaction on amplitude with some scattering center I, and then on the conjugate amplitude the scattering center J, at the end, once you average over the field configurations, they will be identified with each other. Okay, so here is how this calculation is done. So essentially, uh, the easiest way is to do it diagrammatically. Um, but what diagram I, the, I will not explain how to compute the diagrams, but the point is that you compute the diagrams in a series where you count the number of uh, interactions with the medium. So at leading order, the first diagrams are these ones where you only have one interaction with the medium. And of course, because it's squared, you have two, two gluon exchanges. But the important part in this calculation is uh, when you average over the pos all possible configurations of this uh, medium, uh, medium, or now you can put the, the medium uh, particles to scatter with the, the particle in the jet, uh, you have to do some sum over this, this, uh, this, these particles, which you can convert into a continuous uh, average over um, over some density of scattering centers in the medium. In general, taking this integral is not possible because it would imply knowing what is the, the transverse, the, the distribution of these color charges in, in the transverse plane, which it's it's not known, or even if you put a model, it, it will give you very complicated formula. So what, what is usually done is that we ignore this dependence in the density of scattering centers in the medium and also in the in the Dubai mass in the medium because the Dubai mass uh, has the same dependence on temperature as, as the as this quantity, which I, I didn't know. So ignoring this means that you ignore all gradients in temperature. And then because of this, essentially you can then do all the all the calculation, which just tells you that this all these interactions happen by uh, 
by exchanging the same momentum on this leg and then and on this leg. Okay, the all the calculation goes is not so important, but the point is that with 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 this with this uh, with this assumption, you can show that the full distribution is not just exponential of this object v, and v is just the um, the interaction of us of the of the particle propagating in the medium with a, with a single uh, with a single scattering center in the medium. Okay, so what it means is just that the full the the final distribution taking into account all accounts all possible interactions between the particle and the medium is just exponential of the it just exponentiates the single the interaction of the particle with a single scattering center. Now uh, now we want to do the same calculation but for anisotropic media. Which means that we cannot do this approximation anymore. But since we want to solve this, what 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 uh, what we do is to use the fact that uh, the, the I mean the the QGP is believed to be a, like a, a liquid, so it can be described by hydro. And as you know, in hydro you can do a, a gradient expansion. And so what we do is the same. So we say that the for example the density can be expanded as the an isotropic distribution plus some some uh, term that depends on the gradients of of of, uh, of the density distribution and since uh, and with this we can still do the calculation because um essentially the difference to to this uh, to this um to this simpler form is that instead of getting the identification of the momentum on the legs on the side of the diagram now you have uh, the derivative of of this of this delta function okay and uh, and then you you just use these ingredients. You repeat the calculation. You can see that you can still compute the the contribution coming from n uh, gluon exchanges. And then you can even resum all of these series into some complicated form, which I will explain later. Now there is a simpler way to do this calculation, which is instead of doing this diagram by diagram, you can first resum all interactions at the level of the propagators in the matter. Um, and what happens is that you can essentially think of the particle propagating in a medium between some initial position x0 at time 0 to some position xl at time l as, the, as some as given by this integral which just describes the so it has a kinetic term which describes the the, the kind of the, ran, the randomness of of this uh, path through the medium just because this is not, not a classical uh, not a classical particle and then there is a potential term which describes all these possible interactions between the medium and the uh, and the probe. The the nice thing about this approach is that, for example, if you want to compute the previous process, the only thing that now you have to compute is some correlator between these two types of propagators. And uh, to compute these propagators is in general difficult, so you can essentially expand them and, and redo the calculation that I showed before. But since we assume that the the medium has, has Gaussian statistics, you can still do it because the um, essentially the lowest order uh, correlator between the the exponential of this potential uh, with uh, with itself is just equal to the exponential of of this potential v that I showed in the beginning, which just takes into account a single gluon exchange between the medium and the particle. And once you go to to a medium which is not isotropic, this formula generalizes to not only be the potential, but also um, but also as, as as this previous term, which takes into account the anisotropies. Uh, one way to think about what this term is is just to think that this v here can be written in general as some um, density times some function and then you know that the density in principle depends uh on the position of the particle in the medium which in in this coordinate is given by 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 this sum so essentially if you start expanding the density it will be you know uh, some some number so the density times uh, one plus the 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 leading order time in the in the in the the in, in the in the usual uh, expansion which is what you get here okay now let me just uh, talk uh, explain to you what 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 are the properties of this final distribution that you get so as i mentioned the first term is just the usual um, isotropic distribution and then there is uh, a bunch of corrections which have to do with the, the anisotropy in general this distribution takes this form so this first term is what you always get in isotropic media. And when you Fourier transform into momentum space can be interpreted as the momentum broadening distribution, which tells you essentially um, what is the momentum accumulated by particles due to the interactions with the medium. And this uh, operator here is just the unit operator. When you have anisotropies, there, is, there are corrections to this term, but also 
there is some non-trivial operator which connects the final the, the final distribution with with the initial distribution of particles, uh, which breaks this naive factorization that we have in isotropic matter. So that that's a bit um, undesirable because it tells you that these things don't really factorize from the initial distribution, but that's that's how it works. And in particular, if you assume that this initial distribution is a Gaussian. Uh, the important part from from phonology is that now you can generate odd uh, average moments of this distribution. So in isotropic media, the all the uh, odd powers, odd, odd moments of, of this distribution are zero. But here, even though the leading one is zero, you can show that, the, um, for example, the moments of this form are non-zero. And as I said, they will scale with the they will scale with some parameter which is suppressed by e. But it can be large because it is enhanced by by powers of L. But of course, I mean, it depends on other parameters. So you cannot really say that if it is large or small, depending on what, 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 how you choose to describe the matter. But then it's linear in, in the gradients of, of the density. And here it pick up it picks up these logs, which are just the um, which just have to do with the fact that the interactions between the medium and the matter are kind of the Coulomb form, and this is the Coulomb log that you always get when you have a Coulomb potential. Okay, and. Um, looking at plots so here i'm plotting this distribution for um for a particular model for the medium but the important part here is that what i'm showing is how this distribution behaves it only depends on this angle theta which measures the angle with respect to the anisotropy so in this plot the anisotropy is pointing this way so this is along the anisotropy if theta equals equal to zero or if theta equals to pi it's uh, against the anisotropy and the size of this, uh, the magnitude of this anisotropy is controlled by this parameter CT, which, which is defined in this way. So here what I show in this, not the best plot, but what I'm showing here is that this, is this uh, momentum distribution multiplied by PT. So in, in, the, in the isotropic case, it's the black points. And then if you are along the anisotropy are the dashed lines. And if you are um, against the anisotropy, it's the full lines. So for the largest coefficient for the anisotropy, which are the green ones, you see that if you are along the anisotropy, you essentially promote the this distribution to be larger at higher momentum, meaning that the anisotropy will increase the probability of having uh, of giving more momentum to the particle. While if you are moving against the anisotropy, essentially you kill off the largest momentum modes, but you allow it essentially push it. You, you reduce the amount of uh, momentum that the particle can gain by evolving in a medium. Um, okay, so this is the calculation for just a single particle going through the medium. But uh, as I said, I mean, now we also, I mean, we have to worry about what happens if you have gluon production. So here is the, the equivalent calculation, but taking into account the production of a gluon. So again, we start with some distribution J. We, we evolve this particle in the medium, it will radiate some gluon at some point. And then at the end of the day, what we want to know is, uh, assuming that this initial particle is sufficiently uh, hard, so it's such that we don't really care about uh, how it is distributed at the end of the day, we want to know what is the distribution of the gluon uh, in the final state. Okay, so uh, this calculation is a bit more evolved, so I'll just kind of show you the, the you know, figures on how to do it. But the point is that to do this calculation in, in this perturbative uh, kind of diagrammatic approach, it's it's possible, but it's it's quite, uh, it's, it's a bit painful to do. But as I showed you, you can do this with this recent propagator, and it turns out that it is much more convenient to do it this way, because the only thing that one has to compute is this, um, is these correlators of different, uh, different ways to arrange this, these propagators in the medium. So this plot here is a kind of a, a summary of the calculation. So what you say is that you start with some current that describes the initial particle. So here it just for gluon, but it doesn't matter. And then this particle will emit some gluon at some point. And because in the medium, the production of, of, of particles is not local, in the conjugate amplitudes, the, the diagram will be the same, but this vertex doesn't have to be at the same position, okay? So for there are essentially two regions that uh, describe the physics of this process. So one has to do with the production of the gluon, which is in between the emission of the gluon in amplitude and conjugate amplitude. And then there is a final region which describes the, the evolution of the state uh, after all particles have been produced. And this says essentially is very similar to the previous calculation because it does just have to do with evolutions of particles in some medium. So it just it just tells you how the momentum of these particles gets bended due to the fact that there is some matter here. 
So at the level of the, the final distribution, you can show that uh, it, the, the, the formula for, for this process can be written in this way. So there is some term which has to do with the initial production of, of these particles. Then, as I said, there is a term which is uh, this green box in terms of some k, which is some particular correlator of, of this uh, propagator that I showed. And then finally, there is this S2 function, which um, you can show it is the same object as the one that I previously showed in, in, in for the momentum broadening of a single particle. Okay, So this part is solved. And now the only thing that we have to do is to solve for this object. But it turns out that um, this thing you cannot really solve in the same way as, as for, for what we did here. But what you can always do, since at the end we do some gradient expansion, is to just solve it in perturbation theory in the in the gradients, okay? And if you do this exercise, you can show that this this uh, this cross section or this uh, so this is a cross section. But here I wrote it in terms of some radiation spectrum, and you can write it in terms of some uh, isotropic radiation spectrum. So that doesn't depend on this um, azimuthal angle, and then and then uh, a leading order term which will depend on the on the on the dot product between the momentum. The transverse momentum of the gluon and this vector here, which encapsulates all the anisotropies in the medium, and then some distribution that doesn't depend on this angle. And the way this final function is computed, it is uh, so it, it has, of course, the isotropic part. And then the last parts have to do with this uh, perturbative calculation of this object. So it, there will be a term which comes from the uh, from the perturbative expansion of this of this S2, which here it's P. Then there is a term which comes from the perturbative expansion of K and, and so on. Okay, and here are the kind of numerical results uh, after doing this calculation. So here on the left, I show this for this parameter gamma T, which is, uh, so gamma T is the same as this CT parameter, it just controls the size of the anisotropy. So this has smaller, sorry, larger values for the anisotropy, and this has largest, smallest values for the anisotropy. On the y-axis, I plot the, the spectrum as a function of the KT of the final bloom. Okay, and then what you can see here for this particular parameter that we chose is that uh, if you are moving um, against the sorry the anisotropy, you see the enhancement of the distribution uh, okay in in momentum space, and if you are moving uh, along the, the anisotropy, you see now the reduction. Uh, of course, as you reduce the the value of this uh, anisotropy, these things changes, and at some point it will also flip. Um, the reason why it's more complicated than the momentum distribution is because this this distribution now is is three dimensional, and of course, uh, the particular way it behaves depends on how we plot it, as as I will show after. So, for example, here I'm showing uh, the average momentum of this distribution as a function of omega, so differential still in the gluon energy. And as I mentioned here, since if you are moving uh, against the uh, anisotropy, you increase the distribution. Of course, the the these moments are all negative, meaning that so naively it looks like that the gluons get bended. Uh, so the gluons are produced uh, now uh, against the the, the increasing uh, uh, anisotropy in the medium, which is a bit counterintuitive. Um, Okay, so finally, let me maybe show you some plots which are a bit more easy to understand rather than these more uh, abstract calculations. So here, what I'm going to show you is how to compute some observables for the for a jet of uh, of radius r, and what I will use is that there is some anisotropy in which is static. Okay, it's always in this direction, which is denoted by this vector g, and this has some angle alpha with respect to the gluon being emitted, and also the gluon has some angle theta with respect to the jet axis. Um, okay, so we, we using this calculation that I showed you before, we compute to your observables. So the first one that we compute is the jet shape. Uh, so the jet shape is not really an ideal observable, but it's what was computed a long time ago in these early papers, which I mentioned in the beginning. But here now we can do the calculation by having, you know, like the, at least the correct formula in some in some particular construction. And as you can see, we qualitatively we agree with their picture because uh, I mean. Because of course, the way by construction they should agree, but what you see now is kind of uh, showing more um, um, a picture which is more conceptually clear than what I showed you before. So here I'm showing on this axis is increasing gluon energy, and here as a function of increasing anisotropy in the medium, 
And what I'm plotting is a differential jet shape. So it's the distribution of energy within some cone of radius R, differential on the energy of the gluon and on the azimuthal angle, which means that essentially you are looking uh, upwards from this plot. You are looking in what is the energy, sorry, inside this small radius R, given that only uh, gluons bit up to a frequency omega can contribute. And what you see is, as you go to, so if you go to very large gluon frequencies, nothing happens because at the very lar large gluon frequencies, uh, these type of corrections don't matter. But if you go to smaller frequencies or smaller gluon energies, you see that there are there is a larger density of gluons moving along the direction of the anisotropy. And on the away side, you see the opposite. So there is a valley that tells you that there is a depletion of of um, of gluons in in the in the in the final state. Now this observable is not very good because you, I mean, it, it, it's too inclusive. So when once you integrate over everything, this effect will disappear. So what we tried to do next was to look at, at other jet shapes. So, so he, essentially what we are looking at is moments uh, of this distribution. So here g of r is some 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 polynomial, so r uh, r squared and so on. And then what we want to know is what is the value of this observable where we weight this polynomial by the energy fractions for each one of the particles in the jet. And then you can show that this distribution okay, can be written in this way at leading order. So here I show you the, the results for the when this is n equals to two, so r squared, which is related to the jet mass. So here is the case for pt equals to 50 and here pt equals to 100. And I'm plotting this distribution as a function of the jet mass here. And you see essentially once you have, um, so the black line is the case where you have uh, no gradients. The red one is when you have, uh, it's when you are measuring this quantity against the gradients and the blue is when you are measuring it along the gradients. And you see that when you are measuring along the gradients, first the jet mass increases, which is naively what you would expect. And also the distribution becomes wider. Um, the problem with this observable now is that these effects only appear at the small value, values of the mass, which is uh, what makes sense because it's where you have the contributions from the softest gluons. And the problem is, of course, that this region is dominated by uh, Sudakov effects, which gives you this, uh, which kill, which gives you this, this, um, which kills the divergence that appear in the in, in the spectrum. And because they appear in the same region, essentially, it means that uh, in practice, it it's it will be challenging to see this dependence. Uh, because of this uh, con uh, uh, of this competition, so at the end, what we decided to to do was to look for an observable which doesn't seem to suffer from these effects. So what we considered was this uh, new type of observables, uh, these energy correlators. So I, I don't have time to explain to you how, how these are constructed, but the idea is that if you have some event in in a collider, you can collect some statistics. This will give you some distribution, and then you can measure uh, correlations between the energy flows of this final distribution. And the simplest of the simplest correlator is, of course, a two-point correlator of this distribution. And uh, this is what we compute here. So in general, this correlator will depend on the angular separation of the two points where you measure the, the correlator, but also on the azimuthal angle of, of this object because the medium is no longer isotropic. So in, in we know that essentially that this, since this object knows about the scales in the medium, it should be sensitive to, 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 to the transition in the medium or essentially the medium can resolve the two outgoing legs as being resolved or not. That's why you see this bump. So there is a region where it's not resolved in the region where it's resolved. And here what we do is to measure this angle, not only in this theta angle, but also on this theta, on this alpha angle, which is the azimuthal angle. And then as you can see, this, this observer has this nice feature that there is a clear separation between the three curves throughout a, I mean, a quite large range in, in this angle theta. And essentially it's telling you that if you measure now this observable in differential in these two angles, you can try to look for anisotropic effects inside the jets um, at this level. Of course, it's, it's, it's a bit more complicated than that because even in the vacuum, there would be some separation. But uh, I mean, in, in this leading order calculation that we can do that, that, that this effect is quite clear. And also it doesn't suffer from any of the other effects that I showed you in the previous plots. So uh, finally, let me just uh, instead of giving you a conclusion, just give you outlook of other directions that are being explored. So today I only talk to you about anisotropies in the medium. So meaning like uh, 
the effect that the medium can have larger density in one direction compared to another. But of course, the medium in heavy ions also has some flow, and you can try to compute cor uh, corrections to the properties of the jet due to, 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 to the flow. And this is being done in a series of uh, other papers by my collaborators and other people. Uh, also, uh, a problem in all the calculations that I showed you is that we cannot really go uh, very far because it's very hard to do semi-analytical calculations using real geometry. So at some point you need to do like full-fledged full uh, numerical calculation or simulation. So we cannot really do it uh, at our level, but what we are doing now is to compare essentially these anisotropic distributions in LBT compared to our, our analytic calculations. And what we see is that the behavior of, uh, of this distribution is really almost the same, which is good because it means that in the simplest case, if the distributions agree, then once you turn L LBT into a, a simulation where you take into account a realistic background, then you you would expect that whatever you get is what you you would see using our our formulas and uh, yeah that's that's what everything i wanted to tell you okay thank you um so i think we can take some questions i didn't see any posted on slack but Someone's typing on Slack right now, I believe. Yeah, so we have a question on Slack. Um, can you please talk about the energy correlator observable again? So maybe just uh, go back yes. to the energy correlator. And I think, oops, I guess it's a question for more explanation of that yeah so okay I, I know i didn't fully okay i didn't have time to fully explain how, how this um observable is constructed so um okay so the way this is done is by defining uh, this operator okay and this operator is just the um, is proportional to the so it depends uh, directly on, on the energy momentum tensor, right? And you are just looking essentially at the energy flow at uh, infinity going through some sphere. Okay, let me do it another way. So imagine you have some sphere and now you look at, at the energy that flows through through this sphere at, 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 at when you take the radius to infinity, okay? And this, this is what this object is measuring. Now, when you look at this one, which are two of them in two different directions, N1 and N2, what you are saying is you take you are measuring uh, the energy flows going through N1 and N2, and now you want to know what is the, the two-point correlator of, of this uh, of, of, uh, measurement. Okay, so at, at leading order, what, what you, it's easy to show, but what you will get is that this will be proportional to the, to the cross-section of producing a particle, two particles distancing uh, an angle theta. So, okay, I cannot go back. So essentially what it will tell you is the cross-section to produce, uh, let's say, a quark and a gluon distinct, with distance theta. And then uh, finally, the only thing that you have to do is to weigh this by the um, by their uh, fractional energy. So, okay, so it will be something like d sigma over sigma multiplied by the energy of the quark times the energy of the gluon. And that's how you compute this distribution. Uh, Roughly, I mean, okay, I, I, I don't have any good slides to explain this in more details than just at the level of words. But, uh, okay, I should say that if you go to this paper, you can, for example, see this at the top, a very simple level for heavy ions, for example. I'm not sure if this fully answered the question or if you wanted to understand why, why do we have this separation of bands. Can I ask a question here? Yes. So, Joao, when you do this uh, three particle correlation, uh, what what is the limit? Uh, so, I know that when the angle is very large, three particle is two particle, right? So, oh, uh, yes. So, so okay. obviously, so, it, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, okay. So. Um, so ideally, I would prefer to do three-point correlators just because three-point correlator in principle should be sensitive uh, 
to more scale, which is what we need. But uh, since we, I mean, to compute this requires knowing the, I mean, it requires doing some other calculation that we don't know how to do now. So what, what we did instead was to use two point correlator, which is what I wrote here. But mm -hmm. the difference is that in the vacuum or in, or in your paper, um, so in the vacuum, there is this, of course, uh, assumption that the vacuum is this uh, very large symmetry group. And because of that, um, this object can only depend on the on the separation in angle between the two legs, right? And that's mm -hmm. why it only depends in theta. Mm -hmm. But here, because the medium introduces a, a, a direction, a preferential direction, right? It means that this, this symmetry group is much smaller. And in particular, what it means is that it depends on the separation in angle so it, this object will depend on the separation in angle between the two legs, mm -hmm. but also on the um, on this angle alpha, right? Which is just telling you it depends exactly, for example, if it is pointing this direction or this direction. So now you have to compute the correlator differential in these two angles. That's why you that's why you see the separation in bands. But still, this is just two point correlator. It's just that if you assume that the medium is um, if you assume that the medium is isotropic, you can still compute this object. It's just that it will not depend on this angle. But for us, it depends because of time isotropy. That's it. But if you do, that's 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 my point. If you do three-point correlator at the scale <laughs> in the theta where you see the large separation between the three alphas, it should be exactly the same, right? For the three-point and the two-point. Yeah, I mean, I, okay, I know that the there is a limit where the three point will factorize to two point, but but the um, I mean okay to, to do that I, I what I would do is that I would have to show that that is true also for our calculation. But since we don't know, essentially since we don't know what is a cross section for three for three particles, including medium effects, we cannot really do it. Uh, yeah, I see your point. No, no, no. I I see your point. I was just wondering if like there is some interplay. If we do, if you if you introduce this this medium scale and then you take a ratio of three to two, does this limiting case also play with this medium scale? And then somehow you end up in a very convoluted uh, result that doesn't really tend to a direct physics extraction. But this is a much detailed one that we need to think about. Yeah, I mean that's that's. I know, I know. Okay, I understand your idea. So the idea is to essentially extend these ratios. So, you know, in the usual case, we get the ratios and this gives you the anomalous dimension, which is okay, physical. Right. But for for what you would do in this case is that you would have to compute the three-point correlator with with extra differential dependence on some angle like this one. Then you take the ratio right. to this. Yeah. Yeah. You take the ratio to the 2.1, but then it's very hard to say what, what this... I mean, without doing calculation, it would be very hard to say what the ratio should be equal to, right? Because at the yeah. end, it can be like the ratio of two different uh, functions that depend on these angles. And it's it's not, I mean, not real to me to see what, what it would give you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Sounds, sounds good. I don't see anything else on Slack. Okay. I think we're pretty close to the limit. I, uh, Abhijit, were you going to make some closing remarks? Was that the plan or maybe Raghav? Yeah, I'm happy to to do the to do the closing. So thanks very much well, to all. Abhijit has his microphone on now, so. No, it's okay, Raghav can do that too. Right? Okay. okay, all right. It just took me a while to turn the thing back on, but yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, yeah go ahead, Raghav. Yeah, thanks very much to all the speakers uh, for today. Also, thanks, uh, Joao. <laughs> and I think some of our other speakers have already left, but that's fine. So uh, it's been a great two weeks, guys. I think we had a lot of fun, a lot of hands-on sessions, a lot of learning. I really hope that this has been great for you. So don't forget to do the survey. That's uh, Abhijit also mentioned. It's on the Indico page. and we will figure out how to send an email to you all with that link as well so that you you can you you can you you can do that uh and then yes i mean feel free you have all our contact information you know the github for jetscape if you find something when you start playing with it uh 
you're most welcome to do a pull request and we can discuss anything in more detail uh, there. And yeah, I think we can close the Jetscape Summer School. Yeah, let me just add one more thing. I want to have a special thanks for Raghav and to JM for organizing the, the Summer School. Thanks a lot. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> thanks very much. It was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. As long as <clears throat> if I could get rid of this cough, I would be even more happier. But yeah, it'll happen at some point. All right. Uh, thanks, Bjorn and Lauren, for the chairing today. I think it was great. So let's let's close the let's close the summer school. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you.